And now we begin the tenth canto, chapter one, the advent of Lord Krishna, introduction. King Pariksit said, My dear Lord, you have elaborately described the dynasties of both the moon god and the sun god with the exalted and wonderful character of their kings. O best of Munis, you have also described the descendants of Yadu, who were very pious and strictly adherent to religious principles. Now, if you will, kindly describe the wonderful, glorious activities of Lord Vishnu, or Krishna, who appeared in that Yadu dynasty with Baladev, his plenary expansion. The Supersoul, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, the cause of the cosmic manifestation, appeared in the dynasty of Yadu. Please tell me elaborately about his glorious activities and character from the beginning to the end of his life. Glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is performed in the Parampara system. That is, it is conveyed from spiritual master to disciple. Such glorification is relished by those no longer interested in the false, temporary glorification of this cosmic manifestation. Descriptions of the Lord are the right medicine for the conditioned soul undergoing repeated birth and death. Therefore, who will cease hearing such glorification of the Lord except a butcher or one who is killing his own self? Taking the boat of Krishna's lotus feet, my grandfather Arjun and others crossed the ocean of the battlefield of Kurukshetra, in which such commanders as Bhishmadev resembled great fish that could very easily have swallowed them. By the mercy of Lord Krishna, my grandfathers crossed this ocean, which was very difficult to cross, as easily as one steps over the hoof print of a calf. Because my mother surrendered unto Lord Krishna's lotus feet, the Lord, Sudarshan Chakra in hand, entered her womb and saved my body, the body of the last remaining descendant of the Kurus and the Pandavas, which was almost destroyed by the fiery weapon of Ashvatthama. Lord Sri Krishna, appearing within and outside of all materially embodied living beings by his own potency in the forms of eternal time, that is, as Paramatma and as Virat Rupa, gave liberation to everyone, either as cruel death or as life. Kindly enlighten me by describing his transcendental characteristics. My dear Shukdev Goswami, you have already explained that Sankarshan, who belongs to the second quadruple, appeared as the son of Rohini, named Balaram. If Balaram was not transferred from one body to another, how is it possible that he was first in the womb of Devaki and then in the womb of Rohini? Kindly explain this to me. Why did Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, leave the house of his father Vasudeva? and transfer himself to the house of Nanda in Vrindavan. Where did the Lord, the master of the Yadu dynasty, live with his relatives in Vrindavan? Lord Krishna lived both in Vrindavan and in Mathura. What did he do there? Why did he kill Kamsa, his mother's brother? Such killing is not at all sanctioned in the Shastras. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, has no material body, yet he appears as a human being. For how many years did he live with the descendants of Vrishni? How many wives did he marry? And for how many years did he live in Dvarka? O great sage, who know everything about Krishna, please describe in detail all the activities of which I have inquired, and also those of which I have not, for I have full faith and am very eager to hear them. Because of my vow on the verge of death, I have given up even drinking water, yet because I am drinking the nectar of topics about Krishna, which is flowing from the lotus mouth of your lordship, my hunger and thirst, which are extremely difficult to bear, cannot hinder me. Sutta Goswami said, O son of Bhrigu, Shonakarishi, after Shukdev Goswami, the most respectable devotee, the son of Vyasdev, heard the pious questions of Maharaj Pariksit, he thanked the king with great respect. 
Then he began to discourse on topics concerning Krishna, which are the remedy for all sufferings in this age of Kali. O oh, Your Majesty, best of all saintly kings, because you are greatly attracted to topics of Vasudeva, it is certain that your intelligence is firmly fixed in spiritual understanding, which is the only true goal for humanity. Because that attraction is unceasing, it is certainly sublime. The Ganges, emanating from the toe of Lord Vishnu, purifies the three worlds, the upper, middle, and lower planetary systems. Similarly, when one asks questions about the pastimes and characteristics of Lord Vasudeva, Krishna, three varieties of men are purified, the speaker or preacher, he who inquires, and the people in general who listen. Once when Mother Earth was overburdened by hundreds of thousands of military phalanxes of various conceited demons dressed like kings, she approached Lord Brahma for relief. Mother Earth assumed the form of a cow. Very much distressed with tears in her eyes, she appeared before Lord Brahma and told him about her misfortune. Thereafter, having heard of the distress of Mother Earth, Lord Brahma, with Mother Earth, Lord Shiva, and all the other demigods, approached the shore of the ocean of milk. After reaching the shore of the ocean of milk, the demigods worshipped the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, the master of the whole universe, the supreme god of all gods, who provides for everyone and diminishes everyone's suffering. With great attention, they worshipped Lord Vishnu, who lies on the ocean of milk, by reciting Vedic mantras known as the Purusha Sukta. While in trance, Lord Brahma heard the words of Lord Vishnu vibrating in the sky. Thus he told the demigods, O demigods, hear from me the order of Kshiro Dakashai Vishnu, the Supreme Person, and execute it attentively without delay. Before we submitted our petition to the Lord, he was already aware of the distress on earth. Consequently, for as long as the Lord moves on earth to diminish its burden by his own potency in the form of time, all of you demigods should appear through plenary portions as sons and grandsons in the family of the Yadus. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, who has full potency, will personally appear as the son of Vasudeva. Therefore, all the wives of the demigods should also appear in order to satisfy him. The foremost manifestation of Krishna is Sankarshan, who is known as Ananta. He is the origin of all incarnations within this material world. Previous to the appearance of Lord Krishna, this original Sankarshan will appear as Baladev, just to please the Supreme Lord Krishna in his transcendental pastimes. The potency of the Lord, known as Vishnu Maya, who is as good as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, will also appear with Lord Krishna. This potency, acting in different capacities, captivates all the worlds, both material and spiritual. At the request of her master, she will appear with her different potencies in order to execute the work of the Lord. After thus advising the demigods and pacifying Mother Earth, the very powerful Lord Brahma, who is the master of all other Prajapatis and is therefore known as Prajapati Pati, returned to his own abode, Brahmaloka. Formerly, Shurasena, the chief of the Yadu dynasty, had gone to live in the city of Mathura. There he enjoyed the places known as Mathura and Shurasena. Since that time, the city of Mathura had been the capital of all the kings of the Yadu dynasty. The city and district of Mathura are very intimately connected with Krishna, for Lord Krishna lives there eternally. Some time ago, Vasudeva, who belonged to the demigod family or to the Shura dynasty, married Devaki. After the marriage, he mounted his chariot to return home with his newly married wife. Kamsa, the son of King Ugrasena, in order to please his sister Devaki on the occasion of her marriage, 
took charge of the reins of the horses and became the chariot driver. He was surrounded by hundreds of golden chariots. Devaki's father, King Devaka, was very much affectionate to his daughter. Therefore, while she and her husband were leaving home, he gave her a dowry of 400 elephants nicely decorated with golden garlands. He also gave 10,000 horses, 1,800 chariots, and 200 very beautiful young maidservants fully decorated with ornaments. O beloved son Maharaj Pariksit, when the bride and bridegroom were ready to start, conchels, bugles, drums and kettle drums all vibrated in concert for their auspicious departure. While Kamsa, controlling the reins of the horses, was driving the chariot, along the way an unembodied voice addressed him. You foolish rascal! The eighth child of the woman you are carrying will kill you. Kamsa was a condemned personality in the Boja dynasty because he was envious and sinful. Therefore, upon hearing this omen from the sky, he caught hold of his sister's hair with his left hand and took up his sword with his right hand to sever her head from her body. Wanting to pacify Kamsa, who was so cruel and envious that he was shamelessly ready to kill his sister, the great soul Vasudeva, who was to be the father of Krishna, spoke to him in the following words. My dear brother-in-law Kamsa, you are the pride of your family, the Boja dynasty, and great heroes praise your qualities. How could such a qualified person as you kill a woman, your own sister, especially on, on the occasion of her marriage? O oh, great hero, one who takes birth is sure to die, for death is born with the body. One may die today or after hundreds of years, but death is sure for every living entity. When the present body turns to dust and is again reduced to five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, the proprietor of the body, the living being, automatically receives another body of material elements according to his fruitive activities. When the next body is obtained, he gives up the present body. Just as a person traveling on the road rests one foot on the ground and then lifts the other, or as a worm on a vegetable transfers itself to one leaf and then gives up the previous one, the conditioned soul takes shelter of another body and then gives up the one he had before. Having experienced the situation by seeing or hearing about it, one contemplates and speculates about that situation, and thus one surrenders to it, not considering his present body. Similarly, by mental adjustments, one dreams at night of living under different circumstances, in different bodies, and forgets his actual position. Under the same process, one gives up his present body and accepts another. At the time of death, according to the thinking, feeling, and willing of the mind, which is involved in fruitive activities, one receives a particular body. In other words, the body develops according to the activities of the mind. Changes of body are due to the flickering of the mind, for otherwise the soul could remain in its original spiritual body. When the luminaries in the sky, such as the moon, the sun, and the stars, are reflected in liquids like oil or water, they appear to be of different shapes, sometimes round, sometimes long, and so on, because of the movements of the wind. Similarly, when the living entity, the soul, is absorbed in materialistic thoughts, he accepts various manifestations as his own identity because of ignorance. In other words, one is bewildered by mental concoctions because of agitation from the material modes of nature. Therefore, since envious, impious activities cause a body in which one suffers in the next life, why, why should one act impiously? Considering one's welfare, one should not envy anyone, for an envious person must always fear harm from his enemies, either in this life or in the next. As your younger sister, this poor girl, Devaki, is like your own daughter and deserves to be affectionately maintained. You are merciful and therefore you should not kill her. 
Indeed, she deserves your affection. O oh, best of the Kuru dynasty, Kamsa was fiercely cruel and was actually a follower of the Rakshasas. Therefore, he could be neither pacified nor terrified by the good instructions given by Vasudeva. He did not care about the results of sinful activities, either in this life or in the next. When Vasudeva saw that Kamsa was determined to kill his sister Devaki, he thought to himself very deeply. Considering the imminent danger of death, he thought of another plan to stop Kamsa. As long as he has intelligence and bodily strength, an intelligent person must try to avoid death. This is the duty of every embodied person. But if death cannot be avoided in spite of one's endeavors, a person facing death commits no offense. Vasudeva considered, By delivering all my sons to Kamsa, who is death personified, I shall save the life of Devaki. Perhaps Kamsa will die before my sons take birth. Or, since he is already destined to die at the hands of my son, one of my sons may kill him. For the time being, let me promise to hand over my sons, so that Kamsa will give up this immediate threat. And if in due course of time Kamsa dies, <laughs> well, I shall have nothing to fear. When a fire, for some unseen reason, leaps over one piece of wood and sets fire to the next, the reason is destiny. Similarly, when a living being accepts one kind of body and leaves aside another, there is no other reason than unseen destiny. After thus considering the matter as far as his knowledge would allow, Vasudeva submitted his proposal to the sinful Kamsa with great respect. Vasudeva's mind was full of anxiety because his wife was facing danger. But in order to please the cruel, shameless, and sinful Kamsa, he externally smiled and spoke to him as follows. O oh, best of the sober, you have nothing to fear from your sister Devaki because of what you have heard from the unseen omen. The cause of death will be her sons. Therefore I promise that when she gives birth to the sons from whom your fear has arisen, I shall deliver them all unto your hands. Kamsa agreed to the logical arguments of Vasudeva, and having full faith in Vasudeva's words, he refrained from killing his sister. Vasudeva, being pleased with Kamsa, pacified him further and entered his own house. Each year thereafter, in due course of time, Devaki, the mother of God and all the demigods, gave birth to a child. Thus she bore eight sons, one after another, and a daughter named Subhadra. Vasudeva was very much disturbed by fear of becoming a liar by breaking his promise. Thus, with great pain, he delivered his firstborn son, named Kirtiman, into the hands of Kamsa. What is painful for saintly persons who strictly adhere to the truth? How could there not be independence for pure devotees who know the Supreme Lord as the substance? What deeds are forbidden for persons of the lowest character? And what cannot be given up for the sake of Lord Krishna by those who have fully surrendered at his lotus feet? My dear King Pariksit, when Kamsa saw that Vasudeva, being situated in truthfulness, was completely equipoised in giving him the child, he was very happy. Therefore, with a smiling face, he spoke as follows. O Vasudeva, you may take back your child and go home. I have no fear of your first child. It is the eighth child of you and Devaki I am concerned with, because that is the child by whom I am destined to be killed. Vasudeva agreed and took his child back home. But because Kamsa had no character and no self-control, Vasudeva knew that he could not rely on Kamsa's word. The inhabitants of Vrindavan, headed by Nanda Maharaj and including his associate cowherd men and their wives, were none but denizens of the heavenly planets, O Maharaj Pariksit, best of the descendants of Bharat, and so too were the descendants of the Vrishni dynasty headed by Vasudeva and Devaki and the other women of the dynasty of Yadu. The friends, relatives and well-wishers of both Nanda Maharaj and Vasudeva 
and even those who externally appeared to be followers of Kamsa were all demigods. Once the great saint Nadad approached Kamsa and informed him of how the demoniac persons who were a great burden on the earth were going to be killed. Thus Kamsa was placed into great fear and doubt. After the departure of the great saint Nadad, Kamsa thought that all the members of the Yadu dynasty were demigods and that any of the children born from the womb of Devaki might be Vishnu. Fearing his death, Kamsa arrested Vasudeva and Devaki and chained them with iron shackles. Suspecting each of the children to be Vishnu, Kamsa killed them one after another because of the prophecy that Vishnu would kill him. Kings greedy for sense gratification on this earth almost always kill their enemies indiscriminately. To satisfy their own whims, they may kill anyone, even their mothers, fathers, brothers or friends. In his previous birth, Kamsa had been a great demon named Kalanemi and had been killed by Vishnu. Upon learning this information from Narad, Kamsa became envious of everyone connected with the Yadu dynasty. Kamsa, the most powerful son of Ugrasena, even imprisoned his own father, the king of the Yadu, Boja and Andika dynasties, and personally ruled the states known as Shurasena. Thus ends the first chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Advent of Lord Krishna, Introduction. And now chapter two, prayers by the demigods for Lord Krishna in the womb. Shukdev Goswami said, Under the protection of Magadharaj, Jarasandha, the powerful Kamsa began persecuting the kings of the Yadu dynasty. In this he had the cooperation of demons like Pralamba, Baka, Chanura, Trinavrta, Agasura, Mushtika, Arishta, Dvivida, Putana, Kishi, Denuka, Banasura, Narakasura, and many other demoniac kings on the surface of the earth. Persecuted by the demoniac kings, the Yadavas left their own kingdom and entered various others like those of the Kurus, Panchalas, Kekayas, Shalvas, Vidarbas, Nishadas, Videyas, and Koshalas. Some of their relatives, however, began to follow Kamsa's principles and act in his service. After Kamsa, the son of Ugrasena, killed the six sons of Devaki, a plenary portion of Krishna entered her womb as her seventh child, arousing her pleasure and her lamentation. That plenary portion is celebrated by great sages as Ananta, who belongs to Krishna's second quadruple expansion. To protect the Yadus, his personal devotees, from Kamsa's attack, the Personality of Godhead, Vishvatma, the Supreme Soul of Everyone, ordered Yogamaya as follows. O oh my potency, who are worshipable for the entire world, and whose nature is to bestow good fortune upon all living entities, go to Vraja, where there live many cowherd men and their wives. In that very beautiful land where many cows reside, Rohini, the wife of Vasudeva, is living at the home of Nanda Maharaj. Other wives of Vasudeva are also living there incognito because of fear of Kamsa. Please go there. Within the womb of Devaki is my partial plenary expansion known as Sankarshan or Shesha. Without difficulty, transfer him into the womb of Rohini. O all auspicious Yogamaya, I shall then appear with my full six opulences as the son of Devaki, and you will appear as the daughter of Mother Yashoda, the queen of Maharaj Nanda. By sacrifices of animals, ordinary human beings will worship you gorgeously with various paraphernalia, because you are supreme in fulfilling the material desires of everyone. In different places on the surface of the earth, people will give you different names such as Durga, Bhadrakali, Vijaya, Vaishnavi, 
Kumura, Chandika, Krishna, Madhavi, Kanyaka, Maya, Narayani, Ishani, Sharada, and Ambika. The son of Rohini will also be celebrated as Sankarshan because of being sent from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini. He will be called Ram because of his ability to please all the inhabitants of Gokula and he will be known as Balabhadra because of his extensive physical strength. Thus instructed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Yogamaya immediately agreed. With the Vedic mantra Om, she confirmed that she would do what he asked. Thus having accepted the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, she circumambulated him and started for the place on earth known as Nanda Gokul. There she did everything just as she had been told. When the child of Devaki was attracted and transferred into the womb of Rohini by Yogamaya, Devaki seemed to have a miscarriage. Thus all the inhabitants of the palace loudly lamented, Alas, Devaki has lost her child. Thus the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the Supersoul of all living entities, and who vanquishes all the fear of his devotees, entered the mind of Vasudeva in full opulence. While carrying the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead within the core of his heart, Vasudeva bore the Lord's transcendentally illuminating effulgence, and thus he became as bright as the sun. He was therefore very difficult to see or approach through sensory perception. Indeed, he was unapproachable and unperceivable even for such formidable men as Kamsa, and not only for Kamsa, but for all living entities. Thereafter, accompanied by plenary expansions, the fully opulent Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is all auspicious for the entire universe, was transferred from the mind of Vasudeva to the mind of Devaki. Devaki, having thus been initiated by Vasudeva, became beautiful by carrying Lord Krishna, the original consciousness for everyone, the cause of all causes within the core of her heart, just as the East becomes beautiful by carrying the rising moon. Devaki then kept within herself the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the cause of all causes, the foundation of the entire cosmos. But because she was under arrest in the house of Kangsa, she was like the flames of a fire covered by the walls of a pot, or like a person who has knowledge but cannot distribute it to the world for the benefit of human society. Because the Supreme Personality of Godhead was within her womb, Devaki illuminated the entire atmosphere in the place where she was confined. Seeing her jubilant, pure and smiling, Kamsa thought, The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, who is now within her, will kill me. Devaki has never before looked so brilliant and jubilant. What is my duty now? The Supreme Lord, who knows his purpose, will not give up his prowess. Devaki is a woman. She is my sister. And moreover, she is now pregnant. If I kill her, my reputation, opulence, and duration of life will certainly be vanquished. A person who is very cruel is regarded as dead, even while living. For while he is living, or after his death, everyone condemns him. And after the death of a person in the bodily concept of life, he is undoubtedly transferred to the hell known as Andatama. Deliberating in this way, Kamsa, although determined to continue in enmity toward the Supreme Personality of Godhead, refrained from the vicious killing of his sister. He decided to wait until the Lord was born and then do what was needed. While sitting on his throne or in his sitting room, while lying on his bed or indeed while situated anywhere and while eating, sleeping or walking, Kamsa saw only his enemy, the Supreme Lord, Rishikesha.
In other words, by thinking of his all-pervading enemy, Kamsa became unfavorably Krishna conscious. Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, accompanied by great sages like Narad, Devala and Vyas, and by other demigods like Indra, Chandra and Varuna, invisibly approached the room of Devaki, where they all joined in offering their respectful obeisances and prayers to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who can bestow blessings upon everyone. The demigods prayed, O Lord, you never deviate from your vow, which is always perfect because whatever you decide is perfectly correct and cannot be stopped by anyone. Being present in the three phases of cosmic manifestation, creation, maintenance, and annihilation, you are the supreme truth. Indeed, unless one is completely truthful, one cannot achieve your favor, which therefore cannot be achieved by hypocrites. You are the active principle, the real truth, in all the ingredients of creation, and therefore you are known as Antaryami, the inner force. You are equal to everyone, and your instructions apply for everyone, for all time. You are the beginning of all truth. Therefore, offering our obeisances, we surrender unto you. Kindly give us protection. The body may figuratively be called the original tree. From this tree, which fully depends on the ground of material nature, come two kinds of fruit, the enjoyment of happiness and the suffering of distress. The cause of the tree, forming its three roots, is association with the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. The fruits of bodily happiness have four tastes, religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation, which are experienced through five senses for acquiring knowledge in the midst of six circumstances, namely lamentation, illusion, old age, death, hunger, and thirst. The seven layers of bark covering the tree are skin, blood, muscle, fat, bone, marrow, and semen. And the eight branches of the tree are the five gross and three subtle elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. The tree of the body has nine hollows, the eyes, the ears, the nostrils, the mouth, the rectum, and the genitals, and ten leaves, the ten airs passing through the body. In this tree of the body there are two birds. One is the individual soul, and the other is the super soul. The efficient cause of this material world, manifested with its many varieties as the original tree, is you, O Lord. You are also the maintainer of this material world, and after annihilation you are the one in whom everything is conserved. Those who are covered by your external energy cannot see you behind this manifestation, but theirs is not the vision of learned devotees. O oh Lord, you are always in full knowledge, and to bring all good fortune to all living entities, you appear in different incarnations, all of them transcendental to the material creation. When you appear in these incarnations, you are pleasing to the pious and religious devotees, but for non-devotees, you are the annihilator. O oh Lotus-eyed Lord, by concentrating one's meditation on your lotus feet, which are the reservoir of all existence, and by accepting those lotus feet as the boat by which to cross the ocean of nescience, one follows in the footsteps of the Mahajans, or great saints, sages, and devotees. By this simple process, one can cross the ocean of nescience as easily as one steps over the hoofprint of a calf. O Lord, who resemble the shining sun, 
you are always ready to fulfill the desire of your devotee, and therefore you are known as a desire tree. When Acharyas completely take shelter under your lotus feet in order to cross the fierce ocean of nescience, they leave behind on earth the method by which they cross. And because you are very merciful to your other devotees, you accept this method to help them. Someone may say that aside from devotees who always seek shelter at the Lord's lotus feet, there are those who are not devotees but who have accepted different processes for attaining salvation. What happens to them? In answer to this question, Lord Brahma and the other demigods said, O oh, lotus-eyed Lord, although non-devotees who accept severe austerities and penances to achieve the highest position may think themselves liberated, their intelligence is impure. They fall down from their position of imagined superiority because they have no regard for your lotus feet. O Madhava, Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord of the Goddess of Fortune, if devotees completely in love with you sometimes fall from the path of devotion, they do not fall like non-devotees, for you still protect them. Thus they fearlessly traverse the heads of their opponents and continue to progress in devotional service. O Lord, during the time of maintenance, you manifest several incarnations, all with transcendental bodies beyond the material modes of nature. When you appear in this way, you bestow all good fortune upon the living entities by teaching them to perform Vedic activities, such as ritualistic ceremonies, mystic yoga, austerities, penances, and ultimately samadhi, ecstatic absorption in thoughts of you. Thus you are worshipped by the Vedic principles. O Lord, cause of all causes, if your transcendental body were not beyond the modes of material nature, one could not understand the difference between matter and transcendence. Only by your presence can one understand the transcendental nature of your Lordship, who are the controller of material nature. Your transcendental nature is very difficult to understand unless one is influenced by the presence of your transcendental form. O Lord, your transcendental name and form are not ascertained by those who merely speculate on the path of imagination. Your name, form, and attributes can be ascertained only through devotional service. Even while engaged in various activities, devotees whose minds are completely absorbed at your lotus feet and who constantly hear, chant, contemplate and cause others to remember your transcendental names and forms are always on the transcendental platform and thus they can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. O Lord, we are fortunate because the heavy burden of the demons upon this earth is immediately removed by your appearance. Indeed, we are certainly fortunate, for we shall be able to see upon this earth and in the heavenly planets the marks of lotus, conch shell, club, and disc that adorn your lotus feet. O Supreme Lord, you are not an ordinary living entity appearing in this material world as a result of fruitive activities. Therefore, your appearance or birth in this world has no other cause than your pleasure potency. Similarly, the living entities who are part of you have no cause for miseries like birth, death, and old age, except when these living entities are conducted by your external energy. O Supreme Controller, your Lordship previously accepted incarnations as a fish, a horse, a tortoise, not a Singadev, a boar, a swan, Lord Ramchandra, Parashuram, and among the demigods, Vamanadev, to protect the entire world by your mercy. Now please protect us again by your mercy, by diminishing the disturbances in this world. 
O Krishna, best of the Yadus, we respectfully offer our obeisances unto you. O Mother Deviki, by your good fortune and ours, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself, with all His plenary portions, such as Baladev, is now within your womb. Therefore you need not fear Kamsa, who has decided to be killed by the Lord. Your eternal son, Krishna, will be the protector of the entire Yadu dynasty. After thus offering prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, the Transcendence, all the demigods, with Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva before them, return to their homes in the heavenly planets. Thus ends the second chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Prayers by the Demigods for Lord Krishna in the Womb. And now chapter three, The Birth of Lord Krishna. Thereafter, at the auspicious time for the appearance of the Lord, the entire universe was surcharged with all the qualities of goodness, beauty, and peace. The constellation Rohini appeared, as did stars like Ashmini. The sun, the moon, and the other stars and planets were very peaceful. All directions appeared extremely pleasing, and the beautiful stars twinkled in the cloudless sky. Decorated with towns, villages, mines, and pasturing grounds, the earth seemed all auspicious. The rivers flowed with clear water, and the lakes and vast reservoirs, full of lilies and lotuses, were extraordinarily beautiful. In the trees and green plants, full of flowers and leaves, pleasing to the eyes, birds like cuckoos and swarms of bees began chanting with sweet voices for the sake of the demigods. A pure breeze began to blow, pleasing the sense of touch and bearing the aroma of flowers. And when the Brahmins engaging in ritualistic ceremonies ignited their fires according to Vedic principles, the fires burned steadily, undisturbed by the breeze. Thus when the birthless Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was about to appear, the saints and Brahmins, who had always been disturbed by demons like Kangsa and his men, felt peace within the core of their hearts, and kettle drums simultaneously vibrated from the upper planetary system. The Kinaras and Gandharvas began to sing auspicious songs. The Siddhas and Chadanas offered auspicious prayers. And the Vidyadharis, along with the Apsaras, began to dance in jubilation. The demigods and great saintly persons showered flowers in a joyous mood. The clouds gathered in the sky and very mildly thundered, making sounds like those of the ocean's waves. Then the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, who is situated in the core of everyone's heart, appeared from the womb of Devaki in the dense darkness of night, like the full moon rising on the eastern horizon, because Devaki was of the same category as Sri Krishna. Vasudeva then saw the newborn child, who had very wonderful lotus-like eyes, and who bore in his four hands the four weapons, Shanka, Chakra, Gada, and Padma. On his chest was the mark of Srivatsa, and on his neck the brilliant Kostuba gem. Dressed in yellow, his body blackish like a dense cloud, his scattered hair fully grown, and his helmet and earrings sparkling uncommonly with the valuable gem by Durya, the child, decorated with a brilliant belt, armlets, bangles, and other ornaments, appeared very wonderful. When Vasudev saw his extraordinary son, his eyes were struck with wonder. In transcendental jubilation, he mentally collected ten thousand cows and distributed them among the Brahmins as a transcendental festival. O Maharaj Pariksit, descendant of King Bharat, Vasudev could understand that this child was the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan. Having concluded this without a doubt, he became fearless. Bowing down with folded hands and concentrating his attention, he began to offer prayers to the child who illuminated his birthplace by his natural influence. Vasudev said, My Lord, you are the Supreme Person beyond material existence, and you are the Super Soul. 
Your form can be perceived by transcendental knowledge, by which you can be understood as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I now understand your position perfectly. My Lord, you are the same person who in the beginning created this material world by his personal external energy. After the creation of this world of three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas, you appear to have entered it, although in fact you have not. The mahatattva, the total material energy, is undivided, but because of the material modes of nature, it appears to separate into earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Because of the living energy, or Jiva Bhuta, these separated energies combine to make the cosmic manifestation visible. But in fact, before the creation of the cosmos, the total energy is already present. Therefore, the total material energy never actually enters the creation. Similarly, although you are perceived by our senses because of your presence, you cannot be perceived by the senses nor experienced by the mind or words. With our senses we can perceive some things but not everything. For example, we can use our eyes to see but not to taste. Consequently, you are beyond perception by the senses. Although in touch with the modes of material nature, you are unaffected by them. You are the prime factor in everything, the all-pervading, undivided super-soul. For you, therefore, there is no external or internal. You never entered the womb of Devaki, rather, you existed there already. One who considers his visible body, which is a product of the three modes of nature, to be independent of the soul, is unaware of the basis of existence, and therefore he is a rascal. Those who are learned have rejected his conclusion because one can understand, through full discussion, that with no basis in soul, the visible body and senses would be insubstantial. Nonetheless, although his conclusion has been rejected, a foolish person considers it a reality. O oh my Lord, learned Vedic scholars conclude that the creation, maintenance, and annihilation of the entire cosmic manifestation are performed by you, who are free from endeavor, unaffected by the modes of material nature, and changeless in your spiritual situation. There are no contradictions in you, who are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Parabrahman. Because the three modes of material nature, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, are under your control, everything takes place automatically. My Lord, your form is transcendental to the three material modes. Yet for the maintenance of the three worlds, you assume the white color of Vishnu in goodness. For creation, which is surrounded by the quality of passion, you appear reddish. And at the end, when there is a need for annihilation, which is surrounded by ignorance, you appear blackish. O oh my Lord, proprietor of all creation, you have now appeared in my house, desiring to protect this world. I am sure that you will kill all the armies that are moving all over the world under the leadership of politicians who are dressed as Kshatriya rulers, but who are factually demons. They must be killed by you for the protection of the innocent public. O oh my Lord, Lord of the demigods, after hearing the prophecy that you would take birth in our home and kill him, this uncivilized Kamsa killed so many of your elder brothers. As soon as he hears from his lieutenants that you have appeared, he will immediately come with weapons to kill you. Thereafter, having seen that her child had all the symptoms of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Devaki, who was very much afraid of Kamsa and unusually astonished, began to offer prayers to the Lord. Sri Devaki said, My dear Lord, there are different Vedas, some of which describe you as unperceivable through words and the mind, yet you are the origin of the entire cosmic manifestation. You are Brahman, the greatest of everything, full of effulgence like the sun. You have no material cause. You are free from change and deviation, and you have no material desires. 
Thus the Vedas say that you are the substance. Therefore, my Lord, you are directly the origin of all Vedic statements. And by understanding you, one gradually understands everything. You are different from the light of Brahman and Paramatma, yet you are not different from them. Everything emanates from you. Indeed, you are the cause of all causes, Lord Vishnu, the light of all transcendental knowledge. After millions of years at the time of cosmic annihilation, when everything, manifested and unmanifested, is annihilated by the force of time, the five gross elements enter into the subtle conception, and the manifested categories enter into the unmanifested substance. At that time, you alone remain, and you are known as Anantashesha Naga. O oh, inaugurator of the material energy, this wonderful creation works under the control of powerful time, which is divided into seconds, minutes, hours, and years. This element of time, which extends for many millions of years, is but another form of Lord Vishnu. For your pastimes, you act as the controller of time, but you are the reservoir of all good fortune. Let me offer my full surrender unto your lordship. No one in this material world has become free from the four principles of birth, death, old age, and disease, even by fleeing to various planets. But now that you have appeared, my lord, death is fleeing in fear of you, and the living entities, having obtained shelter at your lotus feet by your mercy, are sleeping in full mental peace. My lord, because you dispel all the fear of your devotees, I request you to save us and give us protection from the terrible fear of Kangsa. Your form as Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is appreciated by yogis in meditation. Please make this form invisible to those who see with material eyes. O Madhusudana, because of your appearance, I am becoming more and more anxious in fear of Kamsa. Therefore, please arrange for that sinful Kamsa to be unable to understand that you have taken birth from my womb. O oh my Lord, you are the all-pervading Supreme Personality of Godhead, and your transcendental four-armed form, holding conch shell, disc, club, and lotus, is unnatural for this world. Please withdraw this form and become just like a natural human child, so that I may try to hide you somewhere. At the time of devastation, the entire cosmos, containing all created, moving, and non-moving entities, enters your transcendental body and is held there without difficulty. But now this transcendental form has taken birth from my womb. People will not be able to believe this, and I shall become an object of ridicule. My dear mother, best of the chaste, in your previous birth, in the Svayambhuva millennium, you were known as Prijni, and Vasudeva, who was the most pious Prajapati, was named Sutapa. When both of you were ordered by Lord Brahma to create progeny, you first underwent severe austerities by controlling your senses. My dear father and mother, you endured rain, wind, strong sun, scorching heat, and severe cold, suffering all sorts of inconvenience according to different seasons. By practicing pranayam to control the air within the body through yoga, and by eating only air and dry leaves fallen from the trees, you cleansed from your minds all dirty things. In this way, desiring a benediction from me, you worship me with peaceful minds. Thus you spent twelve thousand celestial years performing difficult activities of tapasya in consciousness of me, or Krishna consciousness. O sinless mother Devaki, after the expiry of twelve thousand celestial years, in which you constantly contemplated me within the core of your heart with great faith, devotion, and austerity, I was very much satisfied with you. Since I am the best of all bestowers of benediction, I appeared in the same form as Krishna to ask you to take from me the benediction you desired. You then expressed your desire to have a son exactly like me. 
being husband and wife but always sunless, you are attracted by sexual desires. For by the influence of Deva Maya, transcendental love, you wanted to have me as your son. Therefore, you never desire to be liberated from this material world. After you received that benediction and I disappeared, you engage yourselves in sex to have a son like me, and I fulfill your desire. Since I found no one else as highly elevated as you in simplicity and other qualities of good character, I appeared in this world as Prijni Garba, or one who is celebrated as having taken birth from Prijni. In the next millennium, I again appeared from the two of you, who appeared as my mother, Aditi, and my father, Kashyapa. I was known as Upendra, and because of being a dwarf, I was also known as Vamana. O supremely chaste mother, I, the same personality, have now appeared of you both as your son for the third time. Take my words as the truth. I have shown you this form of Vishnu just to remind you of my previous births. Otherwise, if I appeared like an ordinary human child, you would not believe that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu, has indeed appeared. Both of you, husband and wife, constantly think of me as your son, but always know that I am the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By thus thinking of me constantly with love and affection, you will achieve the highest perfection, returning home back to Godhead. After instructing his father and mother, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, remained silent. In their presence, by his internal energy, he then transformed himself into a small human child. In other words, he transformed himself into his original form, Krishna's Tu Bhagavan Svayam. Thereafter, exactly when Vasudeva, being inspired by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was about to take the newborn child from the delivery room, Yoga Maya, the Lord's spiritual energy, took birth as the daughter of the wife of Maharaj Nanda. By the influence of Yoga Maya, all the doorkeepers fell fast asleep, their senses unable to work, and the other inhabitants of the house also fell deeply asleep. When the sun rises, the darkness automatically disappears. Similarly, when Vasudeva appeared, the closed doors, which were strongly pinned with iron and locked with iron chains, opened automatically. Since the clouds in the sky were mildly thundering and showering, Anantanaga, an expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, followed Vasudeva beginning from the door, with hoods expanded to protect Vasudeva and the transcendental child. Because of constant rain sent by the demigod Indra, the river Yamuna was filled with deep water, foaming about with fiercely whirling waves. But as the great Indian Ocean had formerly given way to Lord Ramachandra by allowing him to construct a bridge, the river Yamuna gave way to Vasudeva and allowed him to cross. When Vasudeva reached the house of Nanda Maharaj, he saw that all the cowherd men were fast asleep. Thus he placed his own son on the bed of Yashoda, picked up her daughter, an expansion of Yogamaya, and then returned to his residence, the prison house of Kamsa. Vasudeva placed the female child on the bed of Devaki, bound his legs with the iron shackles, and thus remained there as before. Exhausted by the labor of childbirth, Yashoda was overwhelmed with sleep and unable to understand what kind of child had been born to her. Thus ends the third chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Birth of Lord Krishna. And now chapter four, The Atrocities of King Kangsa. Shukdev Goswami continued, My dear King Pariksit, the doors inside and outside the house closed as before. Thereafter, the inhabitants of the house, especially the watchmen, heard the crying of the newborn child and thus awakened from their beds. Thereafter, all the watchmen very quickly approached King Kamsa, the ruler of the Boja dynasty, and submitted the news of the birth of Devaki's child. Kamsa, who had awaited this news very anxiously, immediately took action. Kamsa immediately got up from bed, thinking, 
Here is Kala, the supreme time factor, which has taken birth to kill me. Thus overwhelmed, Kamsa, his hair scattered on his head, at once approached the place where the child had been born. Devaki helplessly, piteously appealed to Kamsa, My dear brother, all good fortune unto you. Don't kill this girl. She will be your daughter-in-law. Indeed, it is unworthy of you to kill a woman. My dear brother, by the influence of destiny you have already killed many babies, each of them as bright and beautiful as fire. But kindly spare this daughter. Give her to me as, as your gift. My lord, my brother, I am very poor, being bereft of all my children, but still I am your younger sister, and therefore it would be worthy of you to give me this last child as a gift. Piteously embracing her daughter and crying, Devaki begged Kamsa for the child, but he was so cruel that he chastised her and forcibly snatched the child from her hands. Having uprooted all relationships with his sister because of intense selfishness, Kamsa, who was sitting on his knees, grasped the newborn child by the legs and tried to dash her against the surface of a stone. The child, Yogamaya Devi, the younger sister of Lord Vishnu, slipped upward from Kamsa's hands and appeared in the sky as Devi, the goddess Durga, with eight arms, completely equipped with weapons. The goddess Durga was decorated with flower garlands, smeared with sandalwood pulp, and dressed with excellent garments and ornaments made of valuable jewels. Holding in her hands a bow, a trident, arrows, a shield, a sword, a conch shell, a disc, and a club, and being praised by celestial beings like Apsaras, Kinaras, Uragas, Siddhas, Charanas, and Gandharvas, who worshipped her with all kinds of presentations, she spoke as follows. Oh, Kamsa, you fool! What will be the use of killing me? The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who has been your enemy from the very beginning and who will certainly kill you, has already taken his birth somewhere else. Therefore, do not unnecessarily kill other children. After speaking to Kamsa in this way, the goddess Durga, Yogamaya, appeared in different places, such as Varanasi, and became celebrated by different names, such as Anapurna, Durga, Kali, and Bhadra. After hearing the words of the goddess Durga, Kamsa was struck with wonder. Thus he approached his sister Devaki and brother-in-law Vasudeva, released them immediately from their shackles, and very humbly spoke as follows. Alas, my sister! Alas, my brother-in-law! I am indeed so sinful that, exactly like a man-eater, a rakshasa, who eats his own child, I have killed so many sons born of you. Being merciless and cruel, I, I have forsaken all my relatives and friends. Therefore, like a person who has killed a Brahmin, I, I do not know to which planet I shall go, either after death or while breathing. Alas, not only human beings, but sometimes even providence lies. And I am so sinful that I believed the omen of providence and killed so many of my sister's children. O oh, great souls, your children have suffered their own misfortune. Therefore, please do not lament for them. All living entities are under the control of the Supreme, and they cannot always live together. In this world we can see that pots, dolls, and other products of the earth appear, break, and then disappear, mixing with the earth. Similarly, the bodies of all conditioned living entities are annihilated, but the living entities, like the earth itself, are unchanging and never annihilated. One who does not understand the constitutional position of the body and the soul be, he becomes too attached to the bodily concept of life. Consequently, because of attachment to the body and its byproducts, he feels affected by union with and separation from his family, society, and nation. As long as this continues, one continues his material life. 
Otherwise, one is liberated. <sighs> My dear sister Deviki, all good fortune unto you. Everyone suffers and enjoys the results of his own work under the control of providence. Therefore, although your sons have unfortunately been killed by me, please do not lament for them. In the bodily conception of life, one remains in darkness without self-realization, thinking, I am being killed or I have killed my enemies. As long as a foolish person thus considers the self to be the killer or the killed, well, he continues to be responsible for material obligations and consequently he suffers the reactions of happiness and distress. My dear sister and brother-in-law, please be merciful to such a poor-hearted person as me, since both of you are saintly persons. Please excuse my atrocities. Having said this, Kamsa fell at the feet of Vasudeva and Devaki, his eyes full of tears of regret. Fully believing in the words of the goddess Durga, Kamsa exhibited his familial affection for Devaki and Vasudeva by immediately releasing them from their iron shackles. When Devaki saw her brother actually repentant while explaining ordained events, she was relieved of all anger. Similarly, Vasudeva was also free from anger. Smiling, he spoke to Kamsa as follows. O oh, great personality Kamsa, only by the influence of ignorance does one accept the material body and bodily ego. What you have said about this philosophy is correct. Persons in the bodily concept of life, lacking self-realization, differentiate in terms of this is mine and this belongs to another. Persons with the vision of differentiation are imbued with the material qualities lamentation, jubilation, fear, envy, greed, illusion, and madness. They are influenced by the immediate cause, which they are busy counteracting because they have no knowledge of the remote, supreme cause, the personality of Godhead. Thus having been addressed in purity by Devaki and Vasudeva, who were very much appeased, Kamsa felt pleased, and with their permission he entered his home. After that night passed, Kamsa summoned his ministers and informed them of all that had been spoken by Yogamaya, who had revealed that he who was to slay Kamsa had already been born somewhere else. After hearing their master's statement, the envious Asuras, who were enemies of the demigods and were not very expert in their dealings, advised Kamsa as follows. If this is so, O king of the Boja dynasty, beginning today, we shall kill all the children born in all the villages, towns, and pasturing grounds within the past ten days or slightly more. The demigods always fear the sound of your bowstring. They are constantly in anxiety, afraid of fighting. Therefore, what can they do by their endeavors to harm you? While being pierced by your arrows, which you discharged on all sides, some of them who were injured by the multitude of arrows, but who desired to live, fled the battlefield intent on escaping. Defeated and bereft of all weapons, some of the demigods gave up fighting and praised you with folded hands. Some of them, appearing before you with loosened garments and hair, said, O oh Lord, we are very much afraid of you. <laughs> when the demigods are bereft of their chariots, when they forget how to use weapons, when they are fearful or attached to something other than fighting, or when their bows are broken and they have thus lost the ability to fight, your majesty does not kill them. The demigods boast uselessly while away from the battlefield. Only where there is no fighting can they show their prowess. <laughs> Therefore, from such demigods we have nothing to fear. As for Lord Vishnu, he is in seclusion in the core of the hearts of the yogis. As for Lord Shiva, he has gone to the forest. 
And as for Lord Brahma, he is always engaged in austerities and meditation. The other demigods, headed by Indra, they are devoid of prowess. Therefore, you have nothing, absolutely nothing, to fear. Nonetheless, because of their enmity, our opinion is that the demigod should not be neglected, no. Therefore, to uproot them completely, engage us in fighting with them, for we are ready to follow you. As a disease, if initially neglected, becomes acute and impossible to cure, or as the senses, if not controlled at first, are impossible to control later, an enemy, if neglected in the beginning, later becomes insurmountable. The foundation of all the demigods is Lord Vishnu, who lives and is worshipped wherever there are religious principles, traditional culture, the Vedas, cows, Brahmins, austerities, and sacrifices with proper remuneration. O King, we who are your adherents in all respects shall therefore kill the Vedic Brahmins, the persons engaged in offering sacrifices and austerities, and the cows that supply milk from which clarified butter is obtained for the ingredients of sacrifice. The Brahmins, the cows, Vedic knowledge, austerity, truthfulness, control of the mind and senses, faith, mercy, tolerance, and sacrifice are the different parts of the body of Lord Vishnu, and they are the paraphernalia for a godly civilization. Lord Vishnu the super-soul within the core of everyone's heart is the ultimate enemy of the Asuras and is therefore known as Asura Dvit. He is the leader of all the demigods because all the demigods, including Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, exist under his protection. The great saintly persons, sages and Vaishnavas also depend upon him. To persecute the Vaishnavas, therefore, is the only way to kill Vishnu. Thus having considered the instructions of his bad ministers, Kamsa, who was bound by the laws of Yamaraj and devoid of good intelligence because he was a demon, decided to persecute the saintly persons, the Brahmins, as the only way to achieve his own good fortune. These demons, the followers of Kamsa, were expert at persecuting others, especially the Vaishnavas, and could assume any form they desired. After giving these demons permission to go everywhere and persecute the saintly persons, Kamsa entered his palace surcharged with passion and ignorance, and not knowing what was good or bad for them, the Asuras, for whom impending death was waiting, began the persecution of the saintly persons. My dear King, when a man persecutes great souls, all his benedictions of longevity, beauty, fame, religion, blessings, and promotion to higher planets will be destroyed. Thus ends the fourth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Atrocities of King Kamsa. And now chapter five, the meeting of Nanda Maharaj and Vasudeva. Shukdev Goswami said, Nanda Maharaj was naturally very magnanimous, and when Lord Sri Krishna appeared as his son, he was overwhelmed by jubilation. Therefore, after bathing and purifying himself, and dressing himself properly, he invited Brahmins who knew how to recite Vedic mantras. After having these qualified Brahmins recite auspicious Vedic hymns, he arranged to have the Vedic birth ceremony celebrated for his newborn child, according to the rules and regulations, and he also arranged for the worship of the demigods and forefathers. Nanda Maharaj gave two million cows, completely decorated with cloth and jewels, in charity to the Brahmins. 
He also gave them seven hills of grain, covered with jewels and with cloth decorated with golden embroidery. O king, by the passing of time, land and other material possessions are purified. By bathing, the body is purified. And by being cleansed, unclean things are purified. By purificatory ceremonies, birth is purified. By austerity, the senses are purified. And by worship and charity offered to the Brahmins, material possessions are purified. By satisfaction, the mind is purified. And by self-realization or Krishna consciousness, the soul is purified. The Brahmins recited auspicious Vedic hymns, which purified the environment by their vibration. The experts in reciting old histories like the Puranas, the experts in reciting the histories of royal families, and general reciters all chanted while singers sang and many kinds of musical instruments like berries and dandubis played in accompaniment. Vrajapur, the residence of Nanda Maharaj, was fully decorated with varieties of festoons and flags, and in different places gates were made with varieties of flower garlands, pieces of cloth, and mango leaves. The courtyards, the gates near the roads, and everything within the rooms of the houses were perfectly swept and washed with water. The cows, the bulls, and the calves were thoroughly smeared with a mixture of turmeric and oil, mixed with varieties of minerals. Their heads were bedecked with peacock feathers, and they were garlanded and covered with cloth and golden ornaments. O King Pariksit, the cowherd men dressed very opulently with valuable ornaments and garments, such as coats and turbans, decorated in this way and carrying various presentations in their hands, they approached the house of Nanda Maharaj. The gopi wives of the cowherd men were very pleased to hear that Mother Yashoda had given birth to a son, and they began to decorate themselves very nicely with proper dresses, ornaments, black ointment for the eyes, and so on. Their lotus-like faces extraordinarily beautiful, being decorated with saffron and newly grown kunkum, the wives of the cowherd men hurried to the house of Mother Yashoda with presentations in their hands. Because of natural beauty, the wives had full hips and full breasts, which moved as they hurried along. In the ears of the gopis were brilliantly polished jeweled earrings, and from their necks hung metal lockets. Their hands were decorated with bangles, their dresses were of varied colors, and from their hair flowers fell onto the street like showers. Thus, while going to the house of Maharaj Nanda, the gopis, their earrings, breasts, and garlands moving, were brilliantly beautiful. Offering blessings to the newborn child, Krishna, the wives and daughters of the cowherd men said, May you become the king of Raja and long maintain all its inhabitants. They sprinkled a mixture of turmeric powder, oil, and water upon the birthless Supreme Lord and offered their prayers. Now that the all-pervading, unlimited Lord Krishna, the master of the cosmic manifestation, had arrived within the estate of Maharaj Nanda, various types of musical instruments resounded to celebrate the great festival. In gladness, the cowherd men enjoyed the great festival by splashing one another's bodies with a mixture of curd, condensed milk, butter, and water. They threw butter on one another and smeared it on one another's bodies. The great-minded Maharaj Nanda gave clothing, ornaments, and cows in charity to the cowherd men in order to please Lord Vishnu, and thus he improved the condition of his own son in all respects. He distributed charity to the Suttas, the Magadas, the Vandis, and men of all other professions according to their educational qualifications and satisfied everyone's desires. The most fortunate Rohini, the mother of Baladev, was honored by Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, and thus she also dressed gorgeously and decorated herself with a necklace, a garland, and other ornaments. She was busy wandering here and there to receive the women who were guests at the festival. O Maharaj Pariksit, 
The home of Nanda Maharaj is eternally the abode of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and His transcendental qualities, and is therefore always naturally endowed with the opulence of all wealth. Yet beginning from Lord Krishna's appearance there, it became the place for the pastimes of the Goddess of Fortune. Thereafter, my dear King Pariksit, O best protector of the Kuru dynasty, Nanda Maharaj appointed the local cowherd men to protect Gokul and then went to Mathura to pay the yearly taxes to King Kamsa. When Vasudeva heard that Nanda Maharaj, his very dear friend and brother, had come to Mathura and already paid the taxes to Kamsa, he went to Nanda Maharaj's residence. When Nanda Maharaj heard that Vasudeva had come, he was overwhelmed with love and affection, being as pleased as if his body had regained its life. Seeing Vasudeva suddenly present, he got up and embraced him with both arms. O Maharaj Pariksit, having thus been received and welcomed by Nanda Maharaj with honor, Vasudeva sat down very peacefully and inquired about his own two sons because of intense love for them. He said, My dear brother Nanda Maharaj, at an advanced age you had no son at all and were hopeless of having one. Therefore, that you now have a son is a sign of great fortune. It is also by good fortune that I am seeing you. Having obtained this opportunity, I feel as if I have taken birth again. Even though one is present in this world, to meet with intimate friends and dear relatives in this material world is extremely difficult. Many planks and sticks, unable to stay together, are carried away by the force of a river's waves. Similarly, although we are intimately related with friends and family members, we are unable to stay together because of our varied past deeds and the waves of time. My dear friend Nanda Maharaj, in the place where you are living with your friends, is the forest favorable for the animals, the cows? I hope there is no disease or inconvenience. The place must be full of water, grass and other plants. My son Baladev, being raised by you and your wife Yashoda Devi, considers you his father and mother. Is he living very peacefully in your home with his real mother Rohini? When one's friends and relatives are properly situated, one's religion, economic development and sense gratification, as described in the Vedic literatures, are beneficial. Otherwise, if one's friends and relatives are in distress, these three cannot offer any happiness. Alas, King Kamsa killed so many of your children born of Devaki, and your one daughter, the youngest child of all, entered the heavenly planets. Every man is certainly controlled by destiny, which determines the results of one's fruitive activities. In other words, one has a son or daughter because of unseen destiny, and when the son or daughter is no longer present, this also is due to unseen destiny. Destiny is the ultimate controller of everyone. One who knows this is never bewildered. Now, my dear brother, since you have paid the annual taxes to Kamsa and have also seen me, do not stay in this place for many days. It is better to return to Gokul since I know that there may be some disturbances there. After Vasudeva advised Nanda Maharaj in this way, Nanda Maharaj and his associates, the cowherd men, took permission from Vasudeva, yoked their bulls to the bullock carts and started riding for Gokula. Thus ends the fifth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Meeting of Nanda Maharaj and Vasudeva. And now chapter six, the killing of the demon Putana.
perspective, Goswami continued. My dear king, while Nanda Maharaj was on the way home, he considered that what Vasudeva had said could not be false or useless. There must have been some danger of disturbances in Gokul. As Nanda Maharaj thought about the danger for his beautiful son, Krishna, he was afraid and he took shelter at the lotus feet of the Supreme Controller. While Nanda Maharaj was returning to Gokul, the same fierce Putana whom Kamsa had previously engaged to kill babies was wandering about in the towns, cities and villages doing her nefarious duty. My dear King, wherever people in any position perform their occupational duties of devotional service by chanting and hearing Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu, there cannot be any danger from bad elements. Therefore, there was no need for anxiety about Gokul while the Supreme Personality of Godhead was personally present. Once upon a time, Putana Rakshasi, who could move according to her desire and was wandering in outer space, converted herself by mystic power into a very beautiful woman and thus entered Gokul, the abode of Nanda Maharaj. Her hips were full, her breasts were large and firm, seeming to overburden her slim waist, and she was dressed very nicely. Her hair, adorned with a garland of malika flowers, was scattered about her beautiful face. Her earrings were brilliant, and as she smiled very attractively, glancing upon everyone, her beauty drew the attention of all the inhabitants of Vraja, especially the men. When the gopis saw her, they thought that the beautiful goddess of fortune, holding a lotus flower in her hand, had come to see her husband, Krishna. While searching for small children, Putana, whose business was to kill them, entered the house of Nanda Maharaj unobstructed, having been sent by the superior potency of the Lord. Without asking anyone's permission, she entered Nanda Maharaj's room, where she saw the child sleeping in bed, his unlimited power covered like a powerful fire covered by ashes. She could understand that this child was not ordinary, but was meant to kill all demons. Lord Sri Krishna, the all-pervading super-soul, lying on the bed, understood that Putana, a witch who was expert in killing small children, had come to kill him. Therefore, as if afraid of her, Krishna closed his eyes. Thus Putana took upon her lap him who was to be her own annihilation, just as an unintelligent person places a sleeping snake on his lap, thinking the snake to be a rope. Putana Rakshasi's heart was fierce and cruel, but she looked like a very affectionate mother. Thus she resembled a sharp sword in a soft sheath. Although seeing her within the room, Yashoda and Rohini, overwhelmed by her beauty, did not stop her but remained silent because she treated the child like a mother. On that very spot, the fiercely dangerous Rakshasi took Krishna on her lap and pushed her breast into his mouth. The nipple of her breast was smeared with a dangerous, immediately effective poison, but the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, becoming very angry at her, took hold of her breast, squeezed it very hard with both hands, and sucked out both the poison and her life. Unbearably pressed in every vital point, the demon Putana began to cry, Please leave me, leave me, suck my breast no longer. Perspiring, her eyes wide open and her arms and legs flailing, she cried very loudly again and again. As Putana screamed loudly and forcefully, the earth with its mountains and outer space with its planets trembled. The lower planets and all directions vibrated and people fell down, fearing that thunderbolts were falling upon them. In this way, the demon Putana, very much aggrieved because her breast was being attacked by Krishna, lost her life. O King Pariksit, opening her mouth wide and spreading her arms, legs and hair, she fell down in the pasturing ground in her original form as a Rakshasi, as Vritrasura had fallen when killed by the thunderbolt of Indra. O King Pariksit, 
When the gigantic body of Putana fell to the ground, it smashed all the trees within a limit of twelve miles. Appearing in a gigantic body, she was certainly extraordinary. The Rakshasi's mouth was full of teeth, each resembling the front of a plow. Her nostrils were deep like mountain caves, and her breasts resembled big slabs of stone fallen from a hill. Her scattered hair was the color of copper. The sockets of her eyes appeared like deep, blind wells. Her fearful thighs resembled the banks of a river. Her arms, legs, and feet seemed like big bridges, and her abdomen appeared like a dried-up lake. The hearts, ears, and heads of the cowherd men and women were already shocked by the Rakshasi's screaming, and when they saw the fierce wonder of her body, they were even more frightened. Without fear, the child Krishna was playing on the upper portion of Putana Rakshasi's breast, and when the gopis saw the child's wonderful activities, they immediately came forward with great jubilation and picked him up. Thereafter, Mother Yashoda and Rohini, along with the other elderly gopis, waved about the switch of a cow to give full protection to the child Sri Krishna. The child was thoroughly washed with cow urine and then smeared with the dust raised by the movements of the cows. Then different names of the Lord were applied with cow dung on twelve different parts of his body, beginning with the forehead, as done in applying tilak. In this way, the child was given protection. The gopis first executed the process of achamana, drinking a sip of water from the right hand. They purified their bodies and hands with the nyasa mantra, and then applied the same mantra upon the body of the child. To protect the child, they said, May Aja protect your legs. May Maniman protect your knees. Yagya your thighs. Achuta, the upper part of your waist, and Hayagriva, your abdomen. May Keshava protect your heart, Isha, your chest, the sun god, your neck, Vishnu, your arms, Urukrama, your face, and Ishvara, your head. May Chakri protect you from the front. May Sri Hari, Gadadari, the carrier of the club, protect you from the back. And may the carrier of the bow, who is known as the enemy of Madhu, and Lord Ajana, the carrier of the sword, protect your two sides. May Lord Urugaya, the carrier of the conch shell, protect you from all corners. May Upendra protect you from above. May Garuda protect you on the ground. And may Lord Haladhara, the supreme person, protect you on all sides. May Rishikesh protect your senses, and Narayan your life heir. May the master of Shveta Dvip protect the core of your heart, and may Lord Yogeshwar protect your mind. May Lord Prishni Garba protect your intelligence, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead your soul. While you are playing, may Govinda protect you, and while you are sleeping, may Madhava protect you. May Lord Vaikuntha protect you while you are walking, and may Lord Narayan, the husband of the goddess of fortune, protect you while you are sitting. Similarly, may Lord Yagyabuk, the fearful enemy of all evil planets, always protect you while you enjoy life. The evil witches known as Dakinis, Yatudanis, and Kushmandas are the greatest enemies of children, and the evil spirits like Bhutas, Pretas, Pishachas, Yakshas, Rakshasas, and Vinayakas, as well as witches like Kotara, Revati, Jayeshta, Putana, and Matraka are always ready to give trouble to the body, the life air, and the senses, causing loss of memory, madness, and bad dreams. Like the most experienced evil stars, they all create great disturbances, especially for children, but one can vanquish them simply by uttering Lord Vishnu's name. For when Lord Vishnu's name resounds, all of them become afraid and go away. All the gopis, headed by Mother Yashoda, were bound by maternal affection. After they thus chanted mantras to protect the child, Mother Yashoda gave the child the nipple of her breast to suck 
and then got him to lie down on his bed. Meanwhile, all the cowherd men, headed by Nanda Maharaj, returned from Mathura, and when they saw on the way the gigantic body of Putana lying dead, they were struck with great wonder. Nanda Maharaj and the other gopas exclaimed, My dear friends, you must know that Anaka Dandubi, Vasudeva, has become a great saint or a master of mystic power. Otherwise, how could he have foreseen this calamity and predicted it to us? The inhabitants of Vraja cut the gigantic body of Putana into pieces with the help of axes. Then they threw the pieces far away, covered them with wood and burned them to ashes. Because of Krishna's having sucked the breast of the Rakshasi Putana, when Krishna killed her, she was immediately freed from all material contamination. Her sinful reactions automatically vanished, and therefore, when her gigantic body was being burnt, the smoke emanating from her body was fragrant like a guru incense. Putana was always hankering for the blood of human children, and with that desire she came to kill Krishna. But because she offered her breast to the Lord, she attained the greatest achievement. What then is to be said of those who had natural devotion and affection for Krishna as mothers, and who offered him their breasts to suck, or offered something very dear, as a mother offers something to a child? The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is always situated within the core of the heart of the pure devotee and he is always offered prayers by such worshipable personalities as Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva. Because Krishna embraced Putana's body with great pleasure and sucked her breast, although she was a great witch, she attained the position of a mother in the transcendental world and thus achieved the highest perfection. What then is to be said of the cows whose nipples Krishna sucked with great pleasure and who offered their milk very jubilantly with affection, exactly like that of a mother. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is the bestower of many benedictions, including liberation or oneness with the Brahman effulgence. For that Personality of Godhead, the gopis always felt maternal love, and Krishna sucked their breasts with full satisfaction. Therefore, because of their relationship as mother and son, although the gopis were engaged in various family activities, one should never think that they returned to this material world after leaving their bodies. Upon smelling the fragrance of the smoke emanating from Putana's burning body, many inhabitants of Rajabhumi in distant places were astonished. Where is this fragrance coming from, they asked. Thus they went to the spot where Putana's body was being burnt. When the inhabitants of Raja, who had come from distant places, heard the whole story of how Putana had come and then been killed by Krishna, they were certainly astonished, and they offered their blessings to the child for his wonderful deed of killing Putana. Nanda Maharaj, of course, was very much obliged to Vasudeva, who had foreseen the incident and simply thanked him, thinking how wonderful Vasudeva was. O Maharaj Parikshit, best of the Kurus, Nanda Maharaj was very liberal and simple. He immediately took his son Krishna on his lap, as if Krishna had returned from death and by formally smelling his son's head, Nanda Maharaj undoubtedly enjoyed transcendental bliss. Any person who hears with faith and devotion about how Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, killed Putana, and who thus invests his hearing in such childhood pastimes of Krishna, certainly attains attachment for Govinda, the Supreme Original Person. Thus ends the sixth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Killing of the Demon Putana. And now chapter seven the killing of the demon Trinavrata.
critics had said. My Lord, Shukdev Goswami, all the various activities exhibited by the incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are certainly pleasing to the ear and to the mind. Simply by one's hearing of these activities, the dirty things in one's mind immediately vanish. Generally, we are reluctant to hear about the activities of the Lord, but Krishna's childhood activities are so attractive that they are automatically pleasing to the mind and ear. Thus one's attachment for hearing about material things, which is the root cause of material existence, vanishes, and one gradually develops devotional service to the Supreme Lord, attachment for Him, and friendship with devotees who give us the contribution of Krishna consciousness. If you think it fit, kindly speak about those activities of the Lord. Please describe other pastimes of Krishna, the Supreme Personality, who appeared on this planet Earth, imitating a human child and performing wonderful activities like killing Putana. When Mother Yashoda's baby was slanting his body to attempt to rise and turn around, this attempt was observed by a Vedic ceremony. In such a ceremony called Utana, which is performed when a child is due to leave the house for the first time, the child is properly bathed. Just after Krishna turned three months old, Mother Yashoda celebrated this ceremony with other women of the neighborhood. On that day, there was a conjunction of the moon with the constellation Rohini. As the Brahmins joined by chanting Vedic hymns and professional musicians also took part, this great ceremony was observed by Mother Yashoda. After completing the bathing ceremony for the child, Mother Yashoda received the Brahmins by worshipping them with proper respect and giving them ample food grains and other edibles, clothing, desirable cows and garlands. The Brahmins properly chanted Vedic hymns to observe the auspicious ceremony, and when they finished and Mother Yashoda saw that the child felt sleepy, she lay down on the bed with the child until he was peacefully asleep. The liberal Mother Yashoda, absorbed in celebrating the Uttana ceremony, was busy receiving guests, worshipping them with all respect, and offering them clothing, cows, garlands, and grains. Thus she could not hear the child crying for his mother. At that time, the child Krishna, demanding to drink the milk of his mother's breast, angrily threw his legs upward. Lord Sri Krishna was lying down underneath the handcart in one corner of the courtyard, and although his little legs were as soft as leaves, when he struck the cart with his legs, it turned over violently and collapsed. The wheels separated from the axle, the hubs and spokes fell apart, and the pole of the handcart broke. On the cart there were many little utensils made of various metals, and all of them scattered hither and thither. When Mother Yashoda and the other ladies who had assembled for the Uttana festival and all the men headed by Nanda Maharaj saw the wonderful situation, they began to wonder how the handcart had collapsed by itself. They began to wander here and there, trying to find the cause, but were unable to do so. The assembled cowherd men and ladies began to contemplate how this thing had happened. Is it the work of some demon or evil planet, they asked? At that time, the small children present asserted that the cart had been kicked apart by the baby Krishna. As soon as the crying baby had kicked the cart's wheel, the cart had collapsed, there was no doubt about it. The assembled gopis and gopas, unaware that Krishna is always unlimited, could not believe that the baby Krishna had such inconceivable power. They could not believe the statements of the children, and therefore they neglected these statements as being childish talk. Thinking that some bad planet had attacked Krishna, Mother Yashoda picked up the crying child and allowed him to suck her breast. Then she called for experienced Brahmins to chant Vedic hymns and perform an auspicious ritualistic ceremony. 
After the strong, stout cowherd men assembled the pots and paraphernalia on the handcart and set it up as before, the Brahmins performed a ritualistic ceremony with a fire sacrifice to appease the bad planet, and then with rice grains, kusha, water, and curd, they worshipped the Supreme Lord. When Brahmins are free from envy, untruthfulness, unnecessary pride, grudges, disturbance by the opulence of others, and false prestige, their blessings never go in vain. Considering this, Nanda Maharaj soberly took Krishna on his lap and invited such truthful Brahmins to perform a ritualistic ceremony according to the holy hymns of the Sam Veda, Rig Veda, and Yajur Veda. Then while the hymns were being chanted, he bathed the child with water mixed with pure herbs, and after performing a fire ceremony, he sumptuously fed all the Brahmins with first-class grains and other food. Nanda Maharaj, for the sake of the affluence of his own son Krishna, gave the Brahmins cows fully decorated with garments, flower garlands, and gold necklaces. These cows, fully qualified to give ample milk, were given to the Brahmins in charity, and the Brahmins accepted them and bestowed blessings upon the whole family and especially upon Krishna. The Brahmins, who were completely expert in chanting the Vedic hymns, were all yogis fully equipped with mystic powers. Whatever blessings they spoke were certainly never fruitless. One day, a year after Krishna's appearance, Mother Yashoda was patting her son on her lap, but suddenly she felt the child to be heavier than a mountain peak, and she could no longer bear his weight. Feeling the child to be as heavy as the entire universe, and therefore being anxious, thinking that perhaps the child was being attacked by some other ghost or demon, the astonished mother Yashoda put the child down on the ground and began to think of Narayan. Foreseeing disturbances, she called for the Brahmins to counteract this heaviness, and then she engaged in her other household affairs. She had no alternative than to remember the lotus feet of Narayan, for she could not understand that Krishna was the original source of everything. While the child was sitting on the ground, a demon named Trinavrta, who was a servant of Kamsa's, came there as a whirlwind at Kamsa's instigation, and very easily carried the child away into the air. Covering the whole land of Gokul with particles of dust, that demon, acting as a strong whirlwind, covered everyone's vision and began vibrating everywhere with a greatly fearful sound. For a moment, the whole pasturing ground was overcast with dense darkness from the dust storm, and Mother Yashoda was unable to find her son where she had placed him. Because of the bits of sand thrown about by Trinavrta, people could not see themselves or anyone else, and thus they were illusioned and disturbed. Because of the dust storm stirred up by the strong whirlwind, Mother Yashoda could find no trace of her son, nor could she understand why. Thus she fell down on the ground like a cow who has lost her calf and began to lament very pitifully. When the force of the dust storm and the winds subsided, Yashoda's friends, the other gopis, approached Mother Yashoda, hearing her pitiful crying. Not seeing Krishna present, they too felt very much aggrieved and joined Mother Yashoda in crying, their eyes full of tears. Having assumed the form of a forceful whirlwind, the demon Trinavrta took Krishna very high in the sky. But when Krishna became heavier than the demon, the demon had to stop his force and could go no further. Because of Krishna's weight, Trinavrta considered him to be like a great mountain or a hunk of iron. But because Krishna had caught the demon's neck, the demon was unable to throw him off. He therefore thought of the child as wonderful, since he could neither bear the child nor cast aside the burden. With Krishna grasping him by the throat, Trinavrta choked, unable to make even a sound or even to move his hands and legs. 
his eyes popping out, the demon lost his life and fell, along with the little boy, down to the ground of Raja. While the gopis who had gathered were crying for Krishna, the demon fell from the sky onto a big slab of stone. His limbs dislocated as if he had been pierced by the arrow of Lord Shiva like Tripura Asura. The gopis immediately picked Krishna up from the chest of the demon and delivered him, free from all inauspiciousness, to Mother Yashoda. Because the child, although taken into the sky by the demon, was unhurt and now free from all danger and misfortune, the gopis and cowherd men, headed by Nanda Maharaj, were extremely happy. They thought, it is most astonishing that although this innocent child was taken away by the Rakshasa to be eaten, he has returned without having been killed or even injured. Because this demon was envious, cruel and sinful, he has been killed for his own sinful activities. This is the law of nature. An innocent devotee is always protected by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and a sinful person is always vanquished for his sinful life. Nanda Maharaj and the others said, We must previously have performed austerities for a very long time. Worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Perform pious activities for public life, constructing public roads and wells, and also given charity, as a result of which this boy, although faced with death, has returned to give happiness to his relatives. Having seen all these incidents in Brihadvan, Nanda Maharaj became more and more astonished, and he remembered the words spoken to him by Vasudeva in Mathura. One day Mother Yashoda, having taken Krishna up and placed him on her lap, was feeding him milk from her breast with maternal affection. The milk was flowing from her breast and the child was drinking it. O King Pariksit, when the child Krishna was almost finished drinking his mother's milk, and Mother Yashoda was touching him and looking at his beautiful, brilliantly smiling face, the baby yawned, and Mother Yashoda saw in his mouth the whole sky, the higher planetary system and the earth, the luminaries in all directions, the sun, the moon, fire, air, the seas, islands, mountains, rivers, forests, and all kinds of living entities, moving and non-moving. When Mother Yashoda saw the whole universe within the mouth of her child, her heart began to throb, and in astonishment she wanted to close her restless eyes. Thus ends the seventh chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Killing of the Demon Trinavrta. And now chapter eight, Lord Krishna shows the universal form within his mouth. Shukdev Goswami said, O Maharaj Pariksit, the priest of the Yadu dynasty, namely Gargamuni, who was highly elevated in austerity and penance, was then inspired by Vasudeva to go see Nanda Maharaj at his home. When Nanda Maharaj saw Gargamuni present at his home, Nanda was so pleased that he stood up to receive him with folded hands. Although seeing Gargamuni with his eyes, Nanda Maharaj could appreciate that Gargamuni was Adhoksaja. That is, he was not an ordinary person seen by material senses. When Gargamuni had been properly received as a guest and was very comfortably seated, Nanda Maharaj submitted with gentle and submissive words. Dear sir, because you are a devotee, you are full in everything. Yet my duty is to serve you. Kindly order me. What can I do for you? O oh, my Lord, O oh, great devotee, persons like you move from one place to another, not for their own interests, but for the sake of poor-hearted grahastas or householders. Otherwise, they have no interest in going from one place to another. O oh, great saintly person, you have compiled the astrological knowledge by which one can understand past and present unseen things. By the strength of this knowledge, any human being can understand what he has done his past life and how it affects his present life. This is known to you. My Lord, you are the best of the Brahmins, especially because you are fully aware of the Jyoti Shastra, the astrological science. Therefore, you are naturally the spiritual master of every human being. 
This being so, since you have kindly come to my house, kindly execute the reformatory activities for my two sons. My dear Nanda Maharaj, I am the priestly guide of the Yadu dynasty. This is known everywhere. Therefore, if I perform the purificatory process for your sons, Kamsa will consider them the sons of Devaki. Kamsa is both a great diplomat and a very sinful man. Therefore, having heard from Yogamaya, the daughter of Devaki, that the child who will kill him has already been born somewhere else, having heard that the eighth pregnancy of Devaki could not bring forth a female child, and having understood your friendship with Vasudeva, Kamsa, upon hearing that the purificatory process has been performed by me, the priest of the Yadu dynasty, may certainly consider all these points and suspect that Krishna is the son of Devaki and Vasudeva. Then he might take steps to kill Krishna. That would be a catastrophe. My dear great sage, if you think that your performing this process of purification will make Kamsa suspicious, then secretly chant the Vedic hymns and perform the purifying process of second birth here, right here in the cowshed of my house, without the knowledge of anyone else, even my relatives, for this process of purification is essential. <laughs> Having thus been especially requested by Nanda Maharaj to do that which he already desired to do, Gargamuni performed the name-giving ceremony for Krishna and Balaram in a solitary place. Gargamuni said, This child, the son of Rohini, will give all happiness to his relatives and friends by his transcendental qualities. Therefore he will be known as Ram. And because he will manifest extraordinary bodily strength, he will also be known as Bala. Moreover, because he unites two families, Vasudeva's family and the family of Nanda Maharaj, he will be known as Sankarshan. Your son Krishna appears as an incarnation in every millennium. In the past, he assumed three different colors, white, red, and yellow and now he has appeared in a blackish color. In another Dvapra Yuga, he appeared as Lord Ramchandra in the color of Shuka, like a parrot. All such incarnations have now assembled in Krishna. For many reasons, this beautiful son of yours sometimes appeared previously as the son of Vasudeva. Therefore, those who are learned sometimes call this child Vasudeva. For this son of yours, there are many forms and names according to his transcendental qualities and activities. These are known to me, but people in general do not understand them. To increase the transcendental bliss of the cowherd men of Gokul, this child will always act auspiciously for you, and by his grace only you will surpass all difficulties. O Nanda Maharaj, as recorded in history, when there was an irregular, incapable government, Indra having been dethroned and people were being harassed and disturbed by thieves, this child appeared in order to protect the people and enable them to flourish, and he curbed the rogues and thieves. Demons cannot harm the demigods, who always have Lord Vishnu on their side. Similarly, any person or group attached to Krishna is extremely fortunate. Because such persons are very much affectionate toward Krishna, they cannot be defeated by demons like the associates of Kamsa or by the internal enemies, the senses. In conclusion, therefore, O Nanda Maharaj, this child of yours is as good as Narayan. In his transcendental qualities, opulence, name, fame and influence, he is exactly like Narayan. You should all raise this child very carefully and cautiously.
After Gargamuni, having instructed Nanda Maharaj about Krishna, departed for his own home, Nanda Maharaj was very pleased and considered himself full of all good fortune. After a short time passed, both brothers, Ram and Krishna, began to crawl on the ground of Vraja with the strength of their hands and knees and thus enjoy their childhood play. When Krishna and Balaram, with the strength of their legs, crawled in the muddy places created in Vraja by cow dung and cow urine, their crawling resembled the crawling of serpents and the sound of their ankle bells was very charming. Very much pleased by the sound of other people's ankle bells, they used to follow these people as if going to their mothers, but when they saw that these were other people, they became afraid and returned to their real mothers, Yashoda and Rohini. Dressed with muddy earth mixed with cow dung and cow urine, the babies looked very beautiful, and when they went to their mothers, both Yashoda and Rohini picked them up with great affection embraced them and allowed them to suck the milk flowing from their breasts. While sucking the breast, the babies smiled and their small teeth were visible. Their mothers, upon seeing those beautiful teeth, enjoyed great transcendental bliss. Within the house of Nanda Maharaj, the cowherd ladies would enjoy seeing the pastimes of the babies, Ram and Krishna. The babies would catch the ends of the calves' tails and the calves would drag them here and there. When the ladies saw these pastimes, they certainly stopped their household activities and laughed and enjoyed the incidents. When Mother Yashoda and Rohini were unable to protect the babies from calamities threatened by horned cows, by fire, by animals with claws and teeth, such as monkeys, dogs, and cats, and by thorns, swords, and other weapons on the ground, they were always in anxiety, and their household engagements were disturbed. At that time, they were fully equipoised in the transcendental ecstasy known as the distress of material affection, for this was aroused within their minds. O King Pariksit, within a very short time, both Ram and Krishna began to walk very easily in Gokul on their legs by their own strength without the need to crawl. Thereafter, Lord Krishna, along with Balaram, began to play with the other children of the cowherd men, thus awakening the transcendental bliss of the cowherd women. Observing the very attractive childish restlessness of Krishna, all the gopis in the neighborhood to hear about Krishna's activities again and again would approach Mother Yashoda and speak to her as follows. Our dear friend Yashoda, your son sometimes comes to our houses before the milking of the cows and releases the calves. And when the master of the house becomes angry, your son merely smiles. Sometimes he devises some process by which he steals palatable curd, butter and milk, which he then eats and drinks. When the monkeys assemble, he divides it with them, and when the monkeys have their bellies so full they won't take any more, he breaks the pots. Sometimes, if he gets no opportunity to steal butter or milk from a house, he will be angry at the householders, and for his revenge, he will agitate the small children by pinching them. Then when the children begin crying, Krishna will go away. When the milk and curd are kept high on a swing hanging from the ceiling and Krishna and Balaram cannot reach it, they arrange to reach it by piling up various planks and turning upside down the mortar for grinding spices. Being quite aware of the contents of a pot, they pick holes in it. When the elderly gopis go about their household affairs, Krishna and Balaram sometimes go into a dark room brightening the place with the valuable jewels and ornaments on their bodies and taking advantage of this light by stealing. Yes, stealing. When Krishna is caught in his naughty activities, the master of the house will say to him, Oh, you are a thief! and artificially express anger at Krishna. Krishna will then reply, I am not a thief. You are a thief. Sometimes being angry, Krishna passes urine and stool in a neat, clean place in our houses. But now, our dear friend Yashoda, this expert thief, 
is sitting before you like, like a very good boy. Sometimes all the gopis would look at Krishna sitting there, his eyes fearful so that his mother would not chastise him. And when they saw Krishna's beautiful face, instead of chastising him, they would simply look upon his face and enjoy transcendental bliss. Mother Yashoda would mildly smile at all this fun and she would not want to chastise her blessed transcendental child. One day, while Krishna was playing with his small playmates, including Balaram and other sons of the Gopas, all his friends came together and lodged a complaint to Mother Yashoda. Mother, they submitted, Krishna has eaten earth. Upon hearing this from Krishna's playmates, Mother Yashoda, who was always full of anxiety over Krishna's welfare, picked Krishna up with her hands to look into his mouth and chastise him. Her eyes fearful, she spoke to her son as follows. Dear Krishna, why are you so restless that you have eaten dirt in a solitary place? This complaint has been lodged against you by all your playmates, including your elder brother Balaram. Now how is this? My dear mother, I have never eaten dirt. All my friends complaining against me are liars. If you think they are being truthful, you can directly look into my mouth and examine it. If you have not eaten earth, then open your mouth wide. When challenged by his mother in this way, Krishna, the son of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, to exhibit pastimes like a human child, opened his mouth. Although the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, who is full of all opulences, did not disturb his mother's parental affection, his opulence was automatically displayed, for Krishna's opulence is never lost at any stage, but is manifest at the proper time. When Krishna opened his mouth wide by the order of Mother Yashoda, she saw within his mouth all moving and non-moving entities, outer space and all directions, along with mountains, islands, oceans, the surface of the earth, the blowing wind, fire, the moon and the stars. She saw the planetary systems, water, light, air, sky, and creation by transformation of ahankara. She also saw the senses, the mind, sense perception, and the three qualities, goodness, passion, and ignorance. She saw the time allotted for the living entities. She saw natural instinct and the reactions of karma and she saw desires and different varieties of bodies, moving and non-moving. Seeing all these aspects of the cosmic manifestation along with herself and Vrindavan Dham, she became doubtful and fearful of her son's nature. Mother Yashoda began to argue within herself, Is this a dream or is it an illusory creation by the external energy? Has this been manifested by my own intelligence? Or is it some mystic power of my child? Oh, therefore, let me surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead and offer my obeisances unto Him, who is beyond the conception of human speculation, the mind, activities, words, and arguments, who is the original cause of this cosmic manifestation, by whom the entire cosmos is maintained, and by whom we can conceive of its existence. Let me simply offer my obeisances, for He is beyond my contemplation, speculation and meditation. He is beyond all of my material activities. It is by the influence of the Supreme Lord's Maya that I am wrongly thinking that Nanda Maharaj is my husband, that Krishna is my son, and that because I am the queen of Nanda Maharaj, all the wealth of cows and calves are my possessions, and all the cowherd men and their wives are my subjects. Actually, I also am eternally subordinate to the Supreme Lord. He is my ultimate shelter. Mother Yashoda, by the grace of the Lord, could understand the real truth. But then again, the Supreme Master, by the influence of the internal potency, Yoga Maya, inspired her to become absorbed in intense maternal affection for her son. 
immediately forgetting Yoga Maya's illusion that Krishna had shown the universal form within his mouth, Mother Yashoda took her son on her lap as before, feeling increased affection in her heart for her transcendental child. The glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are studied through the three Vedas, the Upanishads, the literature of Sankhya Yoga, and other Vaishnav literature. Yet Mother Yashoda considered that Supreme Person her ordinary child. O learned Brahman, Mother Yashoda's breast milk was sucked by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What past auspicious activities did she and Nanda Maharaj perform to achieve such perfection in ecstatic love? Although Krishna was so pleased with Vasudeva and Devaki that he descended as their son, they could not enjoy Krishna's magnanimous childhood pastimes, which are so great that simply chanting about them vanquishes the contamination of the material world. Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, however, enjoyed these pastimes fully, and therefore their position is always better than that of Vasudeva and Devaki. I will explain. To follow the orders of Lord Brahma, Drona, the best of the Vasus, along with his wife Dara, spoke to Lord Brahma in this way. Drona and Dara said, Please permit us to be born on this planet Earth, so that after our appearance, the Supreme Lord, the Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Controller and Master of all planets, will also appear and spread devotional service, the ultimate goal of life so that those born in this material world may very easily be delivered from the miserable condition of materialistic life by accepting this devotional service. When Brahma said, Yes, let it be so, the most fortunate Drona, who was equal to Bhagavan, appeared in Vrajapura, Vrindavan, as the most famous Nanda Maharaj, and his wife Dara appeared as Mother Yashoda, Thereafter, O Maharaj Pariksit, best of the Bharatas, when the Supreme Personality of Godhead became the son of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, they maintained continuous, unswerving devotional love in parental affection. And in their association, all the other inhabitants of Vrindavan, the Gopas and Gopis, developed the culture of Krishna Bhakti. Thus the Supreme Personality, Krishna, along with Balaram, lived in Vrajabhumi, Vrindavan, just to substantiate the benediction of Brahma. By exhibiting different pastimes in his childhood, he increased the transcendental pleasure of Nanda and the other inhabitants of Vrindavan. Thus ends the eighth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, Lord Krishna Shows the Universal Form Within His Mouth. And now chapter 9, Mother Yashoda Binds Lord Krishna. Sri Shukdev Goswami continued. One day when Mother Yashoda saw that all the maidservants were engaged in other household affairs, she personally began to churn the yogurt. While churning, she remembered the childish activities of Krishna, and in her own way she composed songs and enjoyed singing to herself about all those activities. Dressed in a saffron yellow sari with a belt tied about her full hips, Mother Yashoda pulled on the churning rope, laboring considerably, her bangles and earrings moving and vibrating, and her whole body shaking. Because of her intense love for her child, her breasts were wet with milk. Her face, with its very beautiful eyebrows, was wet with perspiration, and malati flowers were falling from her hair. While Mother Yashoda was churning butter, Lord Krishna, desiring to drink the milk of her breast, appeared before her, and in order to increase her transcendental pleasure, he caught hold of the churning rod and began to prevent her from churning. Mother Yashoda then embraced Krishna, allowed him to sit down on her lap, and began to look upon the face of the Lord with great love and affection. Because of her intense affection, milk was flowing from her breast. But when she saw that the milk pan on the oven was boiling over, she immediately left her son to take care of the overflowing milk, although the child was not yet fully satisfied with drinking the milk of his mother's breast. Being very angry and biting his reddish lips with his teeth, Krishna, 
with false tears in his eyes, broke the container of yogurt with a piece of stone. Then he entered a room and began to eat the freshly churned butter in a solitary place. Mother Yashoda, after taking down the hot milk from the oven, returned to the churning spot, and when she saw that the container of yogurt was broken and that Krishna was not present, she concluded that the breaking of the pot was the work of Krishna. Krishna at that time was sitting on an upside-down wooden mortar for grinding spices and was distributing milk preparations such as yogurt and butter to the monkeys as he liked. Because of having stolen, he was looking all around with great anxiety, suspecting that he might be chastised by his mother. Mother Yashoda, upon seeing him, very cautiously approached him from behind. When Lord Sri Krishna saw his mother, stick in hand, he very quickly got down from the top of the mortar and began to flee as if very much afraid. Although yogis try to capture him as Paramatma by meditation, desiring to enter into the effulgence of the Lord with great austerities and penances, they fail to reach him. But Mother Yashoda, thinking that same personality of Godhead, Krishna, to be her son, began following Krishna to catch him. While following Krishna, Mother Yashoda, her thin waist overburdened by her heavy breasts, naturally had to reduce her speed. Because of following Krishna very swiftly, her hair became loose and the flowers in her hair were falling after her. Yet she did not fail to capture her son Krishna. When caught by Mother Yashoda, Krishna became more and more afraid and admitted to being an offender. As she looked upon him, she saw that he was crying, his tears mixing with the black ointment around his eyes. And as he rubbed his eyes with his hands, he smeared the ointment all over his face. Mother Yashoda, catching her beautiful son by the hand, mildly began to chastise him. Mother Yashoda was always overwhelmed by intense love for Krishna, not knowing who Krishna was or how powerful he was. Because of maternal affection for Krishna, she never even cared to know who he was. Therefore, when she saw that her son had become excessively afraid, she threw the stick away and desired to bind him so that he would not commit any further naughty activities. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has no beginning and no end, no exterior and no interior, no front and no rear. In other words, he is all-pervading. Because he is not under the influence of the element of time, for him there is no difference between past, present, and future. He exists in his own transcendental form at all times. Being absolute, beyond relativity, he is free from distinctions between cause and effect, although he is the cause and effect of everything. That unmanifested person who is beyond the perception of the senses had now appeared as a human child and Mother Yashoda, considering him her own ordinary child, bound him to the wooden mortar with a rope. When Mother Yashoda was trying to bind the offending child, she saw that the binding rope was short by a distance the width of two fingers. Thus she brought another rope to join to it. This new rope also was short by a measurement of two fingers, and when another rope was joined to it, it was still two fingers too short. As many ropes as she joined, all of them failed. Their shortness could not be overcome. Thus Mother Yashoda joined whatever ropes were available in the household, but still she failed in her attempt to bind Krishna. Mother Yashoda's friends, the elderly gopis in the neighborhood, were smiling and enjoying the fun. Similarly, Mother Yashoda, although laboring in that way, was also smiling. All of them were struck with wonder. Because of Mother Yashoda's hard labor, her whole body became covered with perspiration, and the flowers and comb were falling from her hair. When child Krishna saw his mother thus fatigued, he became merciful to her and agreed to be bound. 
O Maharaj Pariksit, this entire universe with its great exalted demigods like Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma and Lord Indra is under the control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yet the Supreme Lord has one transcendental attribute. He comes under the control of His devotees. This was now exhibited by Krishna in this pastime. Neither Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, nor even the Goddess of Fortune, who is always the better half of the Supreme Lord, can obtain from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Deliverer from this material world, such mercy as received by Mother Yashoda. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, the son of Mother Yashoda, is accessible to devotees engaged in spontaneous, loving service. But he is not as easily accessible to mental speculators, to those striving for self-realization by severe austerities and penances, or to those who consider the body the same as the self. While Mother Yashoda was very busy with household affairs, the Supreme Lord, Krishna, observed twin trees known as Yamal Arjun, which in a former millennium had been the demigod sons of Kuvera. In their former birth, these two sons, known as Nalakuvara and Manigriva, were extremely opulent and fortunate. But because of pride and false prestige, they did not care about anyone, and thus Narad Muni cursed them to become trees. Thus ends the ninth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Mother Yashoda Binds Lord Krishna. And now chapter 10, Deliverance of the Yamal Arjun Trees. King Pariksit inquired from Shukdev Goswami, O great and powerful saint, what was the cause of Nalakuvara's and Manigriva's having been cursed by Narad Muni? What did they do that was so abominable that even Narad, the great sage, became angry at them? Kindly describe this to me. O King Pariksit, because the two sons of Kuvera had been elevated to the association of Lord Shiva, of which they were very much proud, they were allowed to wander in a garden attached to Kailasa Hill on the bank of the Mandakini River. Taking advantage of this, they used to drink a kind of liquor called Varuni. Accompanied by women singing after them, they would wander in that garden of flowers, their eyes always rolling in intoxication. Within the waters of the Mandakini Ganges, which were crowded with gardens of lotus flowers, the two sons of Kuvera would enjoy young girls, just like two male elephants enjoying in the water with female elephants. O Maharaj Pariksit, by some auspicious opportunity for the two boys, the great saint Devarshi Nadad once appeared there by chance. Seeing them intoxicated with rolling eyes, he could understand their situation. Upon seeing Nadad, the naked young girls of the demigods were very much ashamed. Afraid of being cursed, they covered their bodies with their garments. But the two sons of Kuvera did not do so. Instead, not caring about Nadad, they remained naked. Seeing the two sons of the demigods naked and intoxicated by opulence and false prestige, Devarshi Nadad, in order to show them special mercy, desired to give them a special curse. Thus he spoke as follows. Among all the attractions of material enjoyment, the attraction of riches bewilders one's intelligence more than having beautiful bodily features, taking birth in an aristocratic family, and being learned. When one is uneducated but falsely puffed up by wealth, the result is that one engages his wealth in enjoying wine, women, and gambling. Unable to control their senses, rascals who are falsely proud of their riches or their birth in aristocratic families are so cruel that to maintain their perishable bodies, which they think will never grow old or die, they kill poor animals without mercy. Sometimes they kill animals merely to enjoy an excursion. While living, one may be proud of one's body, thinking oneself a very big man, minister, president, or even demigod. But whatever one may be, after death this body will turn either into worms, into stool, or into ashes. 
If one kills poor animals to satisfy the temporary whims of this body, one does not know that he will suffer in his next birth, for such a sinful miscreant must go to hell and suffer the results of his actions. While alive, does this body belong to its employer, to the self, to the father, the mother, or the mother's father? Does it belong to the person who takes it away by force, to the slave master who purchases it, or to the sons who burn it in the fire? Or if the body is not burned, does it belong to the dogs that eat it? Among the many possible claimants, who is the rightful claimant? Not to ascertain this, but instead to maintain the body by sinful activities, is not good. This body, after all, is produced by the unmanifested nature and again annihilated and merged in the natural elements. Therefore, it is the common property of everyone. Under the circumstances, who but a rascal claims this property as his own and while maintaining it commits such sinful activities as killing animals just to satisfy his whims? Unless one is a rascal, one cannot commit such sinful activities. Atheistic fools and rascals who are very much proud of wealth fail to see things as they are. Therefore, returning them to poverty is the proper ointment for their eyes, so they may see things as they are. At least a poverty-stricken man can realize how painful poverty is, and therefore he will not want others to be in a painful condition like his own. By seeing their faces, one whose body has been pricked by pins can understand the pain of others who are pin-pricked. Realizing that this pain is the same for everyone, he does not want others to suffer in this way. But one who has never been pricked by pins cannot understand this pain. A poverty-stricken man must automatically undergo austerities and penances because he does not have the wealth to possess anything. Thus his false prestige is vanquished. Always in need of food, shelter, and clothing, he must be satisfied with what is obtained by the mercy of providence. Undergoing such compulsory austerities is good for him because this purifies him and completely frees him from false ego. Always hungry, longing for sufficient food, a poverty-stricken man gradually becomes weaker and weaker. Having no extra potency, his senses are automatically pacified. A poverty-stricken man, therefore, is unable to perform harmful, envious activities. In other words, such a man automatically gains the results of the austerities and penances adopted voluntarily by saintly persons. Saintly persons may freely associate with those who are poverty-stricken, but not with those who are rich. A poverty-stricken man, by association with saintly persons, very soon becomes uninterested in material desires, and the dirty things within the core of his heart are cleansed away. Saintly persons, or sadhus, think of Krishna twenty-four hours a day. They have no other interests. Why should people neglect the association of such exalted spiritual personalities and try to associate with materialists, taking shelter of non-devotees, most of whom are proud and rich? Therefore, since these two persons, drunk with the liquor named Varuni or Madhavi, and unable to control their senses, have been blinded by the pride of celestial opulence and have become attached to women, I shall relieve them of their false prestige. These two young men, Nalakuvara and Manigriva, are by fortune the sons of the great demigod Kuvera. But because of false prestige and madness after drinking liquor, they are so fallen that they are naked but cannot understand that they are. Therefore, because they are living like trees, for trees are naked but are not conscious, these two young men should receive the bodies of trees. This will be proper punishment. Nonetheless, 
after they become trees and until they are released, by my mercy they will have remembrance of their past sinful activities. Moreover, by my special favor, after the expiry of one hundred years by the measurement of the demigods, they will be able to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vasudev face to face and thus revive their real position as devotees. Having thus spoken, the great saint Devarshi Nadad returned to his ashram known as Narayan Ashram and Nalakuvara and Manigriva became twin Arjun trees. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, to fulfill the truthfulness of the words of the greatest devotee, Nadad, slowly went to that spot where the twin Arjun trees were standing. He said, Although these two young men are the sons of the very rich Kuvera, and I have nothing to do with them, Devarshi Nadad is my very dear and affectionate devotee, and therefore because he wanted me to come face to face with them, I must do so for their deliverance. Having thus spoken, Krishna soon entered between the two Arjun trees, and thus the big mortar to which he was bound turned crosswise and stuck between them. By dragging behind him with great force the wooden mortar tied to his belly, the boy Krishna uprooted the two trees. By the great strength of the Supreme Person, the two trees, with their trunks, leaves and branches, trembled severely and fell to the ground with a great crash. Thereafter, in that very place where the two Arjun trees had fallen, two great perfect personalities, who appeared like fire personified, came out of the two trees. The effulgence of their beauty illuminating all directions, with bowed heads they offered obeisances to Krishna, and with hands folded they spoke the following words, O Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna, your opulent mysticism is inconceivable. You are the supreme original person, the cause of all causes, immediate and remote, and you are beyond this material creation. Learned Brahmins know, on the basis of the Vedic statement, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, that you are everything, and that this cosmic manifestation, in its gross and subtle aspects, is your form. You are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the controller of everything. The body, life, ego, and senses of every living entity are your own self. You are the Supreme Person, Vishnu, the imperishable controller. You are the time factor, the immediate cause, and you are material nature, consisting of the three modes, passion, goodness, and ignorance. You are the original cause of this material manifestation. You are the super-soul, and therefore you know everything within the core of the heart of every living entity. O Lord, you exist before the creation. Therefore, who, trapped by a body of material qualities in this material world, can understand you? O Lord, whose glories are covered by your own energy, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You are Sankarshan, the origin of creation, and you are Vasudeva, the origin of the Chaturvyuha. Because you are everything and are therefore the Supreme Brahman, we simply offer our respectful obeisances unto you. Appearing in bodies like those of an ordinary fish, tortoise, and hog, you exhibit activities impossible for such creatures to perform, extraordinary, incomparable, transcendental activities of unlimited power and strength. These bodies of yours, therefore, are not made of material elements, but are incarnations of your Supreme Personality. You are the same Supreme Personality of Godhead, who have now appeared with full potency for the benefit of all living entities within this material world. O supremely auspicious, we offer our respectful obeisances unto you, who are the Supreme Good. O most famous descendant and controller of the Yadu dynasty, O son of Vasudeva, O most peaceful, let us offer our obeisances unto your lotus feet. O supreme form, 
We are always servants of your servants, especially of Narad Muni. Now give us permission to leave for our home. It is by the grace and mercy of Narad Muni that we have been able to see you face to face. Henceforward, may all our words describe your pastimes. May our ears engage in oral reception of your glories. May our hands and legs and other senses engage in actions pleasing to you. And may our minds always think of your lotus feet. May our heads offer our obeisances to everything within this world, because all things are also your different forms. And may our eyes see the forms of Vaishnavas, who are non-different from you. The two young demigods thus offered prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although Sri Krishna, the Supreme Godhead, is the master of all, and was certainly Gokuleshvara, the master of Gokul, he was bound to the wooden mortar by the ropes of the gopis, and therefore, smiling widely, he spoke to the sons of Kuvera the following words. The great saint Narad Muni is very merciful. By his curse, he showed the greatest favor to both of you, who were mad after material opulence and who had thus become blind. Although you fell from the higher planet Svargaloka and became trees, you were most favored by him. I knew all of these incidents from the very beginning. When one is face to face with the sun, there is no longer darkness for one's eyes. Similarly, when one is face to face with a sadhu, a devotee who is fully determined and surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one will no longer be subject to material bondage. O Nalakuvara and Manigriva, now you may both return home. Since you desire to be always absorbed in my devotional service, your desire to develop love and affection for me will be fulfilled, and now you will never fall from that platform. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, having spoken to the two demigods in this way, they circumambulated the Lord, who was bound to the wooden mortar, and offered obeisances to Him. After taking the permission of Lord Krishna, they returned to their respective homes. Thus ends the tenth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, Deliverance of the Yamal Arjun Trees. And now chapter 11. The Childhood Pastimes of Krishna Shukdev Goswami continued, O Maharaj Pariksit, when the Yamal Arjun trees fell, all the cowherd men in the neighborhood, hearing the fierce sound and fearing thunderbolts, went to the spot. There they saw the fallen Yamal Arjun trees on the ground. But they were bewildered because even though they could directly perceive that the trees had fallen, they could not trace out the cause for their having done so. Krishna was bound by the rope to the Ulukala, the mortar, which he was dragging. But how could he have pulled down the trees? Who had actually done it? Where was the source for this incident? Considering all these astounding things, the cowherd men were doubtful and bewildered. Then all the cowherd boys said, it is Krishna who has done this. When he was in between the two trees, the mortar fell crosswise. Krishna dragged the mortar, and the two trees fell down. After that, two beautiful men came out of the trees. We have seen this with our own eyes. Because of intense paternal affection, the cowherd men, headed by Nanda, could not believe that Krishna could have uprooted the trees in such a wonderful way. Therefore, they could not put their faith in the words of the boys. Some of the men, however, were in doubt. They thought, since Krishna was predicted to equal Narayan, it might be that he could have done it. When Nanda Maharaj saw his own son bound with ropes to the wooden mortar and dragging it, he smiled and released Krishna from his bonds. The gopis would say, If you dance, my dear Krishna, then I shall give you half a sweetmeat. By saying these words, or by clapping their hands, all the gopis encouraged Krishna in different ways.
At such times, although he was the supremely powerful personality of Godhead, he would smile and dance according to their desire, as if he were a wooden doll in their hands. Sometimes he would sing very loudly at their bidding. In this way, Krishna came completely under the control of the gopis. Sometimes Mother Yashoda and her gopi friends would tell Krishna, bring this article or bring that article. Sometimes they would order him to bring a wooden plank, wooden shoes or a wooden measuring pot and Krishna, when thus ordered by the mothers, would try to bring them. Sometimes, however, as if unable to raise these things, he would touch them and stand there. Just to invite the pleasure of his relatives, he would strike his body with his arms to show that he had sufficient strength. To pure devotees throughout the world who could understand his activities, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, exhibited how much he can be subdued by his devotees, his servants. In this way, he increased the pleasure of the Vrajabhasis by his childhood activities. Once a woman selling fruit was calling, O oh, inhabitants of Vrajabhumi, if you want to purchase some fruits, come here. Upon hearing this, Krishna immediately took some grains and went to barter as if he needed some fruits. While Krishna was going to the fruit vendor very hastily, most of the grains he was holding fell. Nonetheless, the fruit vendor filled Krishna's hands with fruits, and her fruit basket was immediately filled with jewels and gold. Once, after the uprooting of the Yamal Arjun trees, Rohini Devi went to call Ram and Krishna, who had both gone to the riverside and were playing with the other boys with deep attention. Because of being too attached to playing with the other boys, Krishna and Balaram did not return upon being called by Rohini. Therefore, Rohini sent Mother Yashoda to call them back, because Mother Yashoda was more affectionate to Krishna and Balaram. Krishna and Balaram, being attached to their play, were playing with the other boys, although it was very late. Therefore, Mother Yashoda called them back for lunch. Because of her ecstatic love and affection for Krishna and Balaram, milk flowed from her breasts. Mother Yashoda said, My dear son Krishna, lotus-eyed Krishna, come here and drink the milk of my breast. My dear darling, you must be very tired because of hunger and the fatigue of playing so long. There is no need to play any more. My dear Baladev, best of our family, please come immediately with your younger brother Krishna. You both ate in the morning, and now you ought to eat something more. Nanda Maharaj, the king of Raja, is now waiting to eat. Oh, my dear son Balaram, he is waiting for you. Therefore, come back to please us. All the boys playing with you and Krishna should now go to their own homes. My dear Krishna, because of playing all day, your body has become covered with dust and sand. Therefore, come back, take your bath, and cleanse yourself. Today, the moon is conjoined with the auspicious star of your birth. Therefore, be pure, and give cows in charity to the Brahmins. Just see how all your playmates of your own age have been cleansed and decorated with beautiful ornaments by their mothers. You should come here, and after you have taken your bath, eaten your lunch, and been decorated with ornaments, you may play with your friends again. My dear Maharaj Pariksit, because of intense love and affection, Mother Yashoda, Krishna's mother, considered Krishna, who was at the peak of all opulences, to be her own son. Thus she took Krishna by the hand, along with Balaram, and brought them home where she performed her duties by fully bathing them, dressing them, and feeding them. Then one time, having seen the great disturbances in Brihadvana, all the elderly persons among the cowherd men, headed by Nanda Maharaj, assembled and began to consider what to do to stop the continuous disturbing situations in Vraja. At this meeting of all the inhabitants of Gokul, a cowherd man named Upananda, who was the most mature in age and knowledge, and was very experienced according to time, circumstances and country, made this suggestion for the benefit of Ram and Krishna. He said, 
My dear friends, the cowherd men, in order to do good to this place, go cool, we should leave it because so many disturbances are always occurring here just for the purpose of killing Ram and Krishna. The child Krishna, simply by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was somehow or other rescued from the hands of the Rakshasi Putana, who was determined to kill him. Then, again, by the mercy of the Supreme Godhead, the handcart missed falling upon the child. Then again, the demon Trinavrata, in the form of a whirlwind, took the child away into the dangerous sky to kill him, but the demon fell down onto a slab of stone. In that case also, by the mercy of Lord Vishnu or his associates, the child was saved. Even the other day, neither Krishna nor any of his playmates died from the falling of the two trees, although the children were near the trees or even between them. This also is to be considered the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All these incidents are being caused by some unknown demon. Before he comes here to create another disturbance, it is our duty to go somewhere else with the boys until there are no more disturbances. Between Nandeshbar and Mahavan is a place named Vrindavan. This place is very suitable because it is lush with grass, plants and creepers for the cows and the other animals. It has nice gardens and tall mountains and it is full of facilities for the happiness of all the gopas and gopis and our animals. Therefore, let us immediately go today. There is no need to wait any further. If you agree to my proposal, let us prepare all the bullock carts and put the cows in front of us and let us go there. Upon hearing this advice from Upananda, the cowherd men unanimously agreed. Very nice, they said, very nice. Thus they sorted out all their household affairs, placed their clothing and other paraphernalia on the carts, and immediately started for Vrindavan. Keeping all the old men, women, children, and household paraphernalia on the bullock carts, and keeping all the cows in front, the cowherd men picked up their bows and arrows with great care, and sounded bugles made of horn. O King Pariksit, in this way, with bugles vibrating all around, the cowherd men, accompanied by their priests, began their journey. The cowherd women, riding on the bullock carts, were dressed very nicely with excellent garments, and their bodies, especially their breasts, were decorated with fresh kunkum powder. As they rode, they began to chant with great pleasure the pastimes of Krishna. Thus hearing about the pastimes of Krishna and Balaram with great pleasure, Mother Yashoda and Rohini Devi, so as not to be separated from Krishna and Balaram for even a moment, got up with them on one bullock cart. In this situation they all looked very beautiful. In this way they entered Vrindavan, where it is always pleasing to live in all seasons. They made a temporary place to inhabit by placing their bullock carts around them in the shape of a half moon. O King Pariksit, when Ram and Krishna saw Vrindavan, Govardhan, and the banks of the river Yamuna, they both enjoyed great pleasure. In this way, Krishna and Balaram, acting like small boys and talking in half-broken language, gave transcendental pleasure to all the inhabitants of Braja. In due course of time, they became old enough to take care of the calves. Not far away from the residential quarters, both Krishna and Balaram, equipped with all kinds of playthings, played with other cowherd boys and began to tend the small calves. Sometimes Krishna and Balaram would play on their flutes. Sometimes they would throw ropes and stones devised for getting fruits from the trees. Sometimes they would throw only stones and sometimes 
their ankle bells tinkling, they would play football with fruits like bale and amalki. Sometimes they would cover themselves with blankets and imitate cows and bulls and fight with one another, roaring loudly. And sometimes they would imitate the voices of the animals. In this way they enjoyed sporting, exactly like two ordinary human children. One day while Ram and Krishna, along with their playmates, were tending the calves on the bank of the river Yamuna, another demon arrived there, desiring to kill them. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead saw that the demon had assumed the form of a calf and entered among the groups of other calves, he pointed out to Baladev, Here is another demon. Then he very slowly approached the demon as if he did not understand the demon's intentions. Thereafter, Sri Krishna caught the demon by the hind legs and tail, twirled the demon's whole body very strongly until the demon was dead, and threw him into the top of a kapita tree, which then fell down along with the body of the demon who had assumed a great form. Upon seeing the dead body of the demon, all the cowherd boys exclaimed, Well done, Krishna! Very good! Very good! Thank you! In the upper planetary system, all the demigods were pleased, and therefore they showered flowers on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. After the killing of the demon, Krishna and Balaram finished their breakfast in the morning, and while continuing to take care of the calves, they wandered here and there. Krishna and Balaram, the supreme personalities of Godhead, who maintain the entire creation, now took charge of the calves as if cowherd boys. One day all the boys, including Krishna and Balaram, each boy taking his own group of calves, brought the calves to a reservoir of water, desiring to allow them to drink. After the animals drank water, the boys drank water there also. Right by the reservoir, the boys saw a gigantic body resembling a mountain peak broken and struck down by a thunderbolt. They were afraid even to see such a huge living being. That great body demon was named Bakasura. He had assumed the body of a duck with a very sharp beak. Having come there, he immediately swallowed Krishna. When Balaram and the other boys saw that Krishna had been devoured by the gigantic duck, they became almost unconscious, like senses without life. Krishna, who was the father of Lord Brahma, but who was acting as the son of a cowherd man, became like fire, burning the root of the demon's throat, and the demon Bakasura immediately disgorged him. When the demon saw that Krishna, although having been swallowed, was unharmed, he immediately attacked Krishna again with his sharp beak. When Krishna, the leader of the Vaishnavas, saw that the demon Bakasura, the friend of Kansa, was endeavoring to attack him, with his arms he captured the demon by the two halves of the beak, and in the presence of all the cowherd boys, Krishna very easily bifurcated him, as a child splits a blade of virana grass. By thus killing the demon, Krishna very much pleased the denizens of heaven. At that time, the celestial denizens of the higher planetary system showered Malika Pushpa, flowers grown in Nandana Kanana, upon Krishna, the enemy of Bakasura. They also congratulated him by sounding celestial kettle drums and conch shells and by offering prayers. Seeing this, the cowherd boys were struck with wonder. Just as the senses are pacified when consciousness and life return, so when Krishna was freed from this danger, all the boys, including Balaram, thought that their life had been restored. They embraced Krishna in good consciousness, and then they collected their own calves and returned to Rajabhumi, where they declared the incident loudly. When the cowherd men and women heard about the killing of Bakasura in the forest, they were very much astonished. Upon seeing Krishna and hearing the story, they received Krishna very eagerly, thinking that Krishna and the other boys had returned from the mouth of death. Thus they looked upon Krishna and the boys with silent eyes, not wanting to turn their eyes aside now that the boys were safe. The cowherd men, headed by Nanda Maharaj, 
began to contemplate. It is very astonishing that although this boy Krishna has many times faced many varied causes of death, by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it was these causes of fear that were killed instead of him. Although the causes of death, the daityas, were very fierce, they could not kill this boy Krishna. Rather, because they came to kill innocent boys, as soon as they approached, they themselves were killed, exactly like flies attacking a fire. The words of persons in full knowledge of Brahman never become untrue. It is very wonderful that whatever Gargamuni predicted, we are now actually experiencing in all detail. In this way, all the cowherd men, headed by Nanda Maharaj, enjoyed topics about the pastimes of Krishna and Balaram with great transcendental pleasure, and they could not even perceive material tribulations. In this way, Krishna and Balaram passed their childhood age in Vrajabhumi by engaging in activities of childish play, such as playing hide-and-seek, constructing a make-believe bridge on the ocean, and jumping here and there like monkeys. Thus ends the eleventh chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Childhood Pastimes of Krishna. And now chapter twelve, The Killing of the Demon Agasura. Shukdev Goswami continued, O King, one day Krishna decided to take his breakfast as a picnic in the forest. Having risen early in the morning, he blew his bugle made of horn and woke all the cowherd boys in cabs with its beautiful sound. Then Krishna and the boys, keeping their respective groups of calves before them, proceeded from Vrajabhumi to the forest. At that time, hundreds and thousands of cowherd boys came out of their respective homes in Vrajabhumi and joined Krishna, keeping before them their hundreds and thousands of groups of calves. The boys were very beautiful, and they were equipped with lunch bags, bugles, flutes, and sticks for controlling the calves. Along with the cowherd boys and their own groups of calves, Krishna came out with an unlimited number of calves assembled. Then all the boys began to sport in the forest in a greatly playful spirit. Although all these boys were already decorated by their mothers with ornaments of kacha, gunja, pearls and gold, when they went into the forest they further decorated themselves with fruits, green leaves, bunches of flowers, peacock feathers and soft minerals. All the cowherd boys used to steal one another's lunch bags. When a boy came to understand that his bag had been taken away, the other boys would throw it farther away, to a more distant place, and those standing there would throw it still farther. When the proprietor of the bag became disappointed, the other boys would laugh, the proprietor would cry, and then the bag would be returned. Sometimes Krishna would go to a somewhat distant place to see the beauty of the forest. Then all the other boys would run to accompany him, each one saying, I shall be the first to run and touch Krishna. I shall touch Krishna first. In this way, they enjoyed life by repeatedly touching Krishna. All the boys would be differently engaged. Some boys blew their flutes, and others blew bugles made of horn. Some imitated the buzzing of the bumblebees, and others imitated the voice of the cuckoo. Some boys imitated flying birds by running after the birds' shadows on the ground. Some imitated the beautiful movements and attractive postures of the swans. Some sat down with the ducks, sitting silently, and others imitated the dancing of the peacocks. Some boys attracted young monkeys in the trees. Some jumped into the trees, imitating the monkeys. Some made faces as the monkeys were accustomed to do and others jumped from one branch to another. Some boys went to the waterfalls and crossed over the river, jumping with the frogs, and when they saw their own reflections in the water, they would laugh. They would also condemn the sounds of their own echoes. 
In this way, all the cowherd boys used to play with Krishna, who is the source of the Brahman effulgence for jnanis desiring to merge into that effulgence, who is the supreme personality of Godhead for devotees who have accepted eternal servitorship, and who for ordinary persons is but another ordinary child. The cowherd boys, having accumulated the results of pious activities for many lives, were able to associate in this way with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. How can one explain their great fortune? Yogis may undergo severe austerities and penances for many births by practicing yama, niyama, asana, and pranayam, none of which are easily performed. Yet in due course of time, when these yogis attain the perfection of controlling the mind, they will still be unable to taste even a particle of dust from the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What then can we describe about the great fortune of the inhabitants of Rajabhumi, Vrindavan, with whom the Supreme Personality of Godhead personally lived and who saw the Lord face to face? My dear King Pariksit, Thereafter there appeared a great demon named Agasura, whose death was being awaited even by the demigods. The demigods drank nectar every day, but still they feared this great demon and awaited his death. This demon could not tolerate the transcendental pleasure being enjoyed in the forest by the cowherd boys. Agasura, who had been sent by Kamsa, was the younger brother of Putana and Bakasura. Therefore, when he came and saw Krishna at the head of all the cowherd boys, he thought, This Krishna has killed my sister and brother Putana and Bakasura. Therefore, in order to please them both, I shall kill this Krishna along with his assistants, the other cowherd boys. If somehow or other I can make Krishna and his associates serve as the last offering of sesame and water for the departed souls of my brother and sister, then the inhabitants of Rajabhumi, for whom these boys are the life and soul, will automatically <laughs> die. If there is no life, there is no need for the body. Consequently, when their sons are dead, naturally, all the inhabitants of Vraja will die. After thus deciding, that crooked Agasura assumed the form of a huge python, as thick as a big mountain, and as long as eight miles. Having assumed this wonderful python's body, he spread his mouth like a big cave in the mountains and lay down on the road, expecting to swallow Krishna and his associates, the cowherd boys. His lower lip rested on the surface of the earth, and his upper lip was touching the clouds in the sky. The borders of his mouth resembled the sides of a big cave in a mountain, and the middle of his mouth was as dark as possible. His tongue resembled a broad traffic way, his breath was like a warm wind, and his eyes blazed like fire. Upon seeing this demon's wonderful form, which resembled a great python, the boys thought that it must be a beautiful scenic spot in Vrindavan. Thereafter they imagined it to be similar to the mouth of a great python. In other words, the boys, unafraid, thought that it was a statue made in the shape of a great python for the enjoyment of their pastimes. The boy said, Dear friends, is this creature dead or is it actually a living python with its mouth spread wide just to swallow us all? Kindly clear up this doubt. Dear friends, this is certainly an animal sitting here to swallow us all. Its upper lip resembles a cloud reddened by the sunshine, and its lower lip resembles the reddish shadows of a cloud. On the left and right, the two depressions resembling mountain caves are the corners of its mouth, and the high mountain peaks are its teeth. In length and breadth, the animal's tongue resembles a broad traffic way, and the inside of its mouth is very, very dark, like a cave in a mountain. 
The hot fiery wind is the breath coming out of his mouth, which is giving off the bad smell of burning flesh because of all the dead bodies he has eaten. Has this living creature come to swallow us? If he does so, he will immediately be killed like Bakasura without delay. Thus they all looked at the beautiful face of Krishna, the enemy of Bakasura, and laughing loudly and clapping their hands, they entered the mouth of the python. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, who is situated as Antaryami, the Super Soul, in the core of everyone's heart, heard the boys talking among themselves about the artificial python. Unknown to them, it was actually Agasura, a demon who had appeared as a python. Krishna, knowing this, wanted to forbid his associates to enter the demon's mouth. In the meantime, while Krishna was considering how to stop them, all the cowherd boys entered the mouth of the demon. The demon, however, did not swallow them, for he was thinking of his own relatives who had been killed by Krishna and was just waiting for Krishna to enter his mouth. Krishna saw that all the cowherd boys, who did not know anyone but him as their lord, had now gone out of his hand and were helpless, having entered like straws into the fire of the abdomen of Agasura, who was death personified. It was intolerable for Krishna to be separated from his friends, the cowherd boys. Therefore, as if seeing that this had been arranged by his internal potency, Krishna was momentarily struck with wonder and unsure of what to do. Now, what was to be done? How could both the killing of this demon and the saving of the devotees be performed simultaneously? Krishna, being unlimitedly potent, decided to wait for an intelligent means by which he could simultaneously save the boys and kill the demon. Then he entered the mouth of Agasura. When Krishna entered the mouth of Agasura, the demigods, hidden behind the clouds, exclaimed, Alas! Alas! But the friends of Agasura, like Kamsa and other demons, were jubilant. When the invincible Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna heard the demigods crying, Alas! Alas! from behind the clouds, he immediately enlarged himself within the demon's throat just to save himself and the cowherd boys, his own associates, from the demon who wished to smash them. Then, because Krishna had increased the size of his body, the demon extended his own body to a very large size. Nonetheless, his breathing stopped. He suffocated, and his eyes rolled here and there and popped out. The demon's life air, however, could not pass through any outlet, and therefore it finally burst out through a hole in the top of the demon's head. When all the demon's life air had passed away through that hole in the top of his head, Krishna glanced over the dead calves and cowherd boys and brought them back to life. Then Mukunda, who can give one liberation, came out from the demon's mouth with his friends and the calves. From the body of the gigantic python, a glaring effulgence came out, illuminating all directions, and stayed individually in the sky until Krishna came out from the corpse's mouth. Then, as all the demigods looked on, this effulgence entered into Krishna's body. Thereafter, everyone being pleased, the demigods began to shower flowers from Nandana Kanana, the celestial dancing girls began to dance, and the Gandharvas, who are famous for singing, offered songs of prayer. The drummers began to beat their kettle drums, and the Brahmins offered Vedic hymns. In this way, both in the heavens and on earth, everyone began to perform his own duties, glorifying the Lord. When Lord Brahma heard the wonderful ceremony going on near his planet, accompanied by music and songs and sounds of Jaya Jaya, he immediately came down to see the function. Upon seeing so much glorification of Lord Krishna, he was completely astonished. O King Pariksit, when the python-shaped body of Agasura dried up into merely a big skin, it became a wonderful place for the inhabitants of Vrindavan to visit, and it remained so for a long, long time.
This incident of Krishna's saving himself and his associates from death and of giving deliverance to Agasra, who had assumed the form of a python, took place when Krishna was five years old. It was disclosed in Vrajabhumi after one year, as if it had taken place on that very day. Krishna is the cause of all causes, the causes and effects of the material world, both higher and lower, are all created by the Supreme Lord, the original controller. When Krishna appeared as the son of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda, he did so by his causeless mercy. Consequently, for him to exhibit his unlimited opulence was not at all wonderful. Indeed, he showed such great mercy that even Agasura, the most sinful miscreant, was elevated to being one of his associates and achieving Sarupya Mukti, which is actually impossible for materially contaminated persons to attain. If even only once, or even by force, one brings the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead into one's mind, one can attain the supreme salvation by the mercy of Krishna, as did Agasura. What then is to be said of those whose hearts the Supreme Personality of Godhead enters when he appears as an incarnation? Or those who always think of the lotus feet of the Lord, who is the source of transcendental bliss for all living entities, and by whom all illusion is completely removed. Sri Sutta Goswami said, O learned saints, the childhood pastimes of Sri Krishna are very wonderful. Maharaj Pariksit, after hearing about those pastimes of Krishna, who had saved him in the womb of his mother, became steady in his mind and again inquired from Shukdev Goswami to hear about those pious activities. Maharaj Pariksit inquired, O great sage, how could things done in the past have been described as being done at the present. Lord Sri Krishna performed this pastime of killing Agasra during his Komada age. How then, during his Poganda age, could the boys have described this incident as having happened recently? O greatest yogi, my spiritual master, kindly describe why this happened. I am very much curious to know about it. I think that it was nothing but another illusion due to Krishna. O oh my Lord, my spiritual master, although we are the lowest of kshatriyas, we are glorified and benefited because we have the opportunity of always hearing from you the nectar of the pious activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sutta Goswami said, O oh Shonaka, greatest of saints and devotees. When Maharaj Pariksit inquired from Shukdeva Goswami in this way, Shukdeva Goswami, immediately remembering subject matters about Krishna within the core of his heart, externally lost contact with the actions of his senses. Thereafter, with great difficulty, he revived his external sensory perception and began to speak to Maharaj Pariksit about Krishna Katha. Thus ends the twelfth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Killing of the Demon Agasura. And now chapter thirteen, The Stealing of the Boys and Calves by Brahma. Srila Shukdev Goswami said, O best of devotees, most fortunate Pariksit, you have inquired very nicely, for although constantly hearing the pastimes of the Lord, you are perceiving His activities to be newer and newer. Paramahamsas, devotees who have accepted the essence of life, are attached to Krishna in the core of their hearts, and He is the aim of their lives. It is their nature to talk only of Krishna at every moment, as if such topics were newer and newer. They are attached to such topics, just as materialists are attached to topics of women and sex. O King, kindly hear me with great attention. Although the activities of the Supreme Lord are very confidential, no ordinary man being able to understand them, I shall speak about them to you, for spiritual masters explain to a submissive disciple even subject matters that are very confidential and difficult to understand. Then, after saving the boys and calves from the mouth of Agasura, who was death personified, 
Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, brought them all to the bank of the river and spoke the following words. My dear friends, just see how this river bank is extremely beautiful because of its pleasing atmosphere. And just see how the blooming lotuses are attracting bees and birds by their aroma. The humming and chirping of the bees and birds is echoing throughout the beautiful trees in the forest. Also, here the sands are clean and soft. Therefore, this must be considered the best place for our sporting and pastimes. I think we should take our lunch here, since we are already hungry, because the time is very late. Here the calves may drink water and go slowly here and there and eat the grass. Accepting Lord Krishna's proposal, the cowherd boys allowed the calves to drink water from the river and then tied them to trees where there was green tender grass. Then the boys opened their baskets of food and began eating with Krishna in great transcendental pleasure. Like the whirl of a lotus flower surrounded by its petals and leaves, Krishna sat in the center, encircled by lines of his friends, who all looked very beautiful. Every one of them was trying to look forward toward Krishna, thinking that Krishna might look toward him. In this way, they all enjoyed their lunch in the forest. Among the cowherd boys, some placed their lunch on flowers, some on leaves, fruits, or bunches of leaves, some actually in their baskets, some on the bark of trees, and some on rocks. This is what the children imagined to be their plates as they ate their lunch. All the cowherd boys enjoyed their lunch with Krishna, showing one another the different tastes of the different varieties of preparations they had brought from home. Tasting one another's preparations, they began to laugh and make one another laugh. Krishna is Yagyabuk, that is, he eats only offerings of yagya. But to exhibit his childhood pastimes, he now sat with his flute tucked between his waist and his tight cloth on his right side, and with his horn bugle and cow driving stick on his left. Holding in his hand a very nice preparation of yogurt and rice, with pieces of suitable fruit between his fingers, he sat like the whirl of a lotus flower, looking forward toward all his friends, personally joking with them and creating jubilant laughter among them as he ate. At that time, the denizens of heaven were watching, struck with wonder at how the personality of Godhead, who eats only in Yajna, was now eating with his friends in the forest. O Maharaj Pariksit, while the cowherd boys, who knew nothing within the core of their hearts but Krishna, were thus engaged in eating their lunch in the forest, the calves went far away, deep into the forest, being allured by green grass. When Krishna saw that his friends, the cowherd boys, were frightened, he, the fierce controller even of fear itself, said, just to mitigate their fear, my dear friends, do not stop eating. I shall bring your calves back to this spot by personally going after them myself. Let me go and search for the calves, Krishna said. Don't disturb your enjoyment. Then, carrying his yogurt and rice in his hand, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, immediately went out to search for the calves of his friends. To please his friends, he began searching in all the mountains, mountain caves, bushes, and narrow passages. O Maharaj Pariksit, Brahma, who resides in the higher planetary system in the sky, had observed the activities of the most powerful Krishna in killing and delivering Agasura, and he was astonished. Now that same Brahma wanted to show some of his own power and see the power of Krishna, who was engaged in his childhood pastimes, playing as if with ordinary cowherd boys. Therefore, in Krishna's absence, Brahma took all the boys and calves to another place. Thus he became entangled, for in the very near future he would see how powerful Krishna was. Thereafter, when Krishna was unable to find the calves, he returned to the bank of the river. But there he was also unable to see the cowherd boys. Thus he began to search for both the calves and the boys, as if he could not understand what had happened. When Krishna was unable to find the calves and their caretakers, the cowherd boys, anywhere in the forest, he could suddenly understand that this was the work of Lord Brahma. 
thereafter just to create pleasure for both Brahma and for the mothers of the calves and cowherd boys, Krishna, the creator of the entire cosmic manifestation, expanded himself as calves and boys. By his Vasudeva feature, Krishna simultaneously expanded himself into the exact number of missing cowherd boys and calves with their exact bodily features, their particular types of hands, legs, and other limbs, their sticks, bugles, and flutes, their lunch bags, their particular types of dress and ornaments placed in various ways, their names, ages, and forms, and their special activities and characteristics. By expanding himself in this way, beautiful Krishna proved the statement, Samagra Jagad Vishnu Mayam, which means, Lord Vishnu is all-pervading. Now expanding himself so as to appear as all the calves and cowherd boys, all of them as they were, and at the same time appear as their leader, Krishna entered Vrajabhumi, the land of his father, Nanda Maharaj, just as he usually did while enjoying their company. O Maharaj Pariksit, Krishna, who had divided himself as different calves and also as different cowherd boys, entered different cowsheds as the calves and then different homes as different boys. The mothers of the boys, upon hearing the sounds of the flutes and bugles being played by their sons, immediately rose from their household tasks, lifted their boys onto their laps, embraced them with both arms, and began to feed them with their breast milk, which flowed forth because of extreme love specifically for Krishna. Actually, Krishna is everything, but at that time, expressing extreme love and affection, they took special pleasure in feeding Krishna, the Parabrahman, and Krishna drank the milk from his respective mothers as if it were a nectarine beverage. Thereafter, O Maharaj Pariksit, as required according to the scheduled round of his pastimes, Krishna returned in the evening, entered the house of each of the cowherd boys, and engaged exactly like the former boys, thus enlivening their mothers with transcendental pleasure. The mothers took care of the boys by massaging them with oil, bathing them, smearing their bodies with sandalwood pulp, decorating them with ornaments, chanting protective mantras, decorating their bodies with tilak, and giving them food. In this way, the mothers served Krishna personally. Thereafter, all the cows entered their different sheds and began mooing loudly, calling for their respective calves. When the calves arrived, the mothers began licking the calves' bodies again and again and profusely feeding them with the milk flowing from their milk bags. Previously, from the very beginning, the gopis had motherly affection for Krishna. Indeed, their affection for Krishna exceeded even their affection for their own sons. In displaying their affection, they had thus distinguished between Krishna and their sons, but now that distinction disappeared. Although the inhabitants of Rajabhumi, the cowherd men and cowherd women, previously had more affection for Krishna than for their own children, now for one year their affection for their own sons continuously increased, for Krishna had now become their sons. There was no limit to the increment of their affection for their sons, who were now Krishna. Every day they found new inspiration for loving their children as much as they loved Krishna. In this way, Lord Sri Krishna, having himself become the cowherd boys and groups of calves, maintained himself by himself. Thus he continued his pastimes both in Vrindavan and in the forest for one year. One day, five or six nights before the completion of the year, Krishna, tending the calves, entered the forest along with Balaram. Thereafter, while pasturing atop Govardhan Hill, the cows looked down to find some green grass and saw their calves pasturing near Vrindavan not very far away. When the cows saw their own calves from the top of Govardhan Hill, they forgot themselves and their caretakers because of increased affection. And although the path was very rough, they ran toward their calves with great anxiety, each running as if with one pair of legs. 
their milk bags full and flowing with milk, their heads and tails raised, and their humps moving with their necks, they ran forcefully until they reached their calves to feed them. The cows had given birth to new calves, but while coming down from Govardhan Hill, the cows, because of increased affection for the older calves, allowed the older calves to drink milk from their milk bags, and then began licking the calves' bodies in anxiety as if wanting to swallow them. The cowherd men, having been unable to check the cows from going to their calves, felt simultaneously ashamed and angry. They crossed the rough road with great difficulty, and when they came down and saw their own sons, they were overwhelmed by great affection. At that time, all the thoughts of the cowherd men merged in the mellow of paternal love, which was aroused by the sight of their sons. Experiencing a great attraction, their anger completely disappearing, they lifted their sons, embraced them in their arms, and enjoyed the highest pleasure by smelling their sons' heads. Thereafter, the elderly cowherd men, having obtained great feeling from embracing their sons, gradually and with great difficulty and reluctance, ceased embracing them and returned to the forest. But as the men remembered their sons, tears began to roll down from their eyes. Because of an increase of affection, the cows had constant attachment even to those calves that were grown up and had stopped sucking milk from their mothers. When Baladev saw this attachment, he was unable to understand the reason for it, and thus he began to consider as follows. What is this wonderful phenomenon? The affection of all the inhabitants of Brja, including me, toward these boys and calves is increasing as never before, just like our affection for Lord Krishna, the Supersoul of all living entities. Who is this mystic power, and where has she come from? Is she a demigod or a demoness? She must be the illusory energy of my master, Lord Krishna, for who else can bewilder me? Thinking in this way, Lord Balaram was able to see, with the eye of transcendental knowledge, that all these calves and Krishna's friends were expansions of the form of Sri Krishna. Lord Baladev said, O Supreme Controller, these boys are not great demigods as I previously thought, nor are these calves great sages like Nodded. Now I can see that you alone are manifesting yourself in all varieties of difference. Although one, you are existing in the different forms of the calves and boys. Please briefly explain this to me. Having thus been requested by Lord Baladev, Krishna explained the whole situation and Baladev understood it. When Lord Brahma returned, after a moment of time had passed, according to his own measurement, he saw that although by human measurement a complete year had passed, Lord Krishna, after all that time, was engaged, just as before, in playing with the boys and calves who were his expansions. Lord Brahma thought, Whatever boys and calves there were in Gokul, I have kept them sleeping on the bed of my mystic potency, and to this very day they have not yet risen again. A similar number of boys and calves have been playing with Krishna for one whole year, yet they are different from the ones illusioned by my mystic potency. Who are they? Where did they come from? Thus Lord Brahma thinking and thinking for a long time, tried to distinguish between those two sets of boys who were each separately existing. He tried to understand who was real and who was not real, but he couldn't understand at all. Thus, because Lord Brahma wanted to mystify the all-pervading Lord Krishna, who can never be mystified, but who, on the contrary, mystifies the entire universe, he himself was put into bewilderment by his own mystic power. As the darkness of snow on a dark night and the light of a glowworm in the light of day have no value, the mystic power of an inferior person who tries to use it against a person of great power is unable to accomplish anything. Instead, the power of that inferior person is diminished. 
Then while Lord Brahma looked on, all the calves and the boys tending them immediately appeared to have complexions the color of bluish rain clouds and to be dressed in yellow silken garments. All those personalities had four arms holding conch shell, disc, mace and lotus flower in their hands. They wore helmets on their heads, earrings on their ears and garlands of forest flowers around their necks. On the upper portion of the right side of their chests was the emblem of the goddess of fortune. Furthermore, they wore armlets on their arms, the Kostuba gem around their necks, which were marked with three lines like a conch shell, and bracelets on their wrists, with bangles on their ankles, ornaments on their feet, and sacred belts around their waists, they all appeared very beautiful. Every part of their bodies, from their feet to the top of their heads, was fully decorated with fresh, tender garlands of tulsi leaves offered by devotees engaged in worshipping the Lord by the greatest pious activities, namely hearing and chanting. Those Vishnu forms, by their pure smiling, which resembled the increasing light of the moon, and by the sidelong glances of their reddish eyes, created and protected the desires of their own devotees, as if by the modes of passion and goodness. All beings, both moving and non-moving, from the four-headed Lord Brahma down to the most insignificant living entity, had taken forms and were differently worshipping those Vishnu Murtis according to their respective capacities, with various means of worship, such as dancing and singing. All the Vishnu Murtis were surrounded by the opulences, headed by Anima Siddhi, by the mystic potencies headed by Aja, and by the twenty-four elements for the creation of the material world headed by the Mahat Tattva. Then Lord Brahma saw that Kala, the time factor, Svabhava, one's own nature by association, Samskara, reformation, Kama, desire, Karma, fruit of activity, and the Gunas, the three modes of material nature, their own independence being completely subordinate to the potency of the Lord, had all taken forms and were also worshipping those Vishnu Murtis. The Vishnu Murtis all had eternal unlimited forms, full of knowledge and bliss, and existing beyond the influence of time. Their great glory was not even to be touched by the jnanis engaged in studying the Upanishads. Thus Lord Brahma saw the Supreme Brahman, by whose energy this entire universe, with its moving and non-moving living beings, is manifested. He also saw at the same time all the calves and boys as the Lord's expansions. Then by the power of the effulgence of those Vishnu Murtis, Lord Brahma, his eleven senses jolted by astonishment and stunned by transcendental bliss, became silent, just like a child's clay doll in the presence of the village deity. The Supreme Brahman is beyond mental speculation. He is self-manifest, existing in his own bliss, and he is beyond the material energy. He is known by the crest jewels of the Vedas by reputation of irrelevant knowledge. Thus, in relation to that Supreme Brahman, the Personality of Godhead, whose glory had been shown by the manifestation of all the four-armed forms of Vishnu, Lord Brahma, the Lord of Sarasvati, was mystified. What is this, he thought, and then he was not even able to see. Lord Krishna, understanding Brahma's position, then at once removed the curtain of his Yoga Maya. Lord Brahma's external consciousness then revived, and he stood up just like a dead man coming back to life. Opening his eyes with great difficulty, he saw the universe along with himself. Then, looking in all directions, Lord Brahma immediately saw Vrindavan before him, filled with trees which were the means of livelihood for the inhabitants and which were equally pleasing in all seasons.
Vrindavan is the transcendental abode of the Lord, where there is no hunger, anger, or thirst. Though naturally inimical, both human beings and fierce animals live there together in transcendental friendship. Then Lord Brahma saw the Absolute Truth, who is one without a second, who possesses full knowledge and who is unlimited, assuming the role of a child in a family of cowherd men, and standing all alone, just as before, with a morsel of food in his hand, searching everywhere for the calves and his cowherd friends. After seeing this, Lord Brahma hastily got down from his swan carrier, fell down like a golden rod, and touched the lotus feet of Lord Krishna with the tips of the four crowns on his heads. Offering his obeisances, he bathed the feet of Lord Krishna with the water of his tears of joy. Rising and falling again and again at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna for a long time, Lord Brahma remembered over and over the Lord's greatness he had just seen. Then, rising very gradually and wiping his two eyes, Lord Brahma looked up at Mukunda. Lord Brahma, his head bent low, his mind concentrated and his body trembling, very humbly began with faltering words to offer praises to Lord Krishna. Thus ends the thirteenth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, The Stealing of the Boys and Calves by Brahma.